The following program was made possible thanks to the generous support of our Kickstarter backers. Well, Holmes. Beware your host, Jonathan Holmes. Sorry, had a little. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, Sinistar. I'm glad you got that sore throat cleared up. Lauren Lanning, the Lauren Lanning, finally on my show. Here we are. So How are you doing? How are you doing? Thank you so much. I'm doing great. I've been a fan of your work for, for years and years, the Oddworld series, something you started, if I'm remembering correctly, it was mid to late 90s. Is that right? PlayStation yeah, it was, uh, 94. We started Oddworld. Yeah. Thanks, John year I graduated from high school, and I thought, here I am. Well, you know, we're we're all in the 35 to 50 age range in that demographic at this point. Uh, I graduated from high school. I felt like this vulnerable, in a a man's body, but still, what do I do in this big, terrifying world of mine? And then Oddworld comes out, and it's like, I know how you feel, dude. You're going to have to survive this and just figure it out, which is uh, the kind of game making that uh, more and more uh, big AAA studios seem to be afraid to do. There's more and more hand-holding in your, in your average big-budget game because they want everybody to be able to get it. But out, Oddworld, you did not hold my hand. You were willing to kill me right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, we're we're uh, kind of d- d- sadistically cruel, right? <laughs> well, yeah. it, felt, it felt real in that. You know, th- this is real life. You're going to get out into the world. Yeah, get ready to have to learn from your mistakes and not give up and not have things just handed to you, which is... I mean, did you really... Is that honest? Is that sincere? Is that really your experience when you, oh, yeah. when you came out and you experienced it? it you know, I, I admit, I love hearing that. And uh, part of the reason that I love hearing it is that it was really driven by the intent. Is It wasn't... You know, Oddworld cer- certainly was not the creation of a marketing department saying, look at the demographics we have, look at this genre that's, you know, kicking ass, look at what, you you really need to design this product and you're, you're going to have a hit, right? It was not that, right? Because I, I don't think any uh, marketing department anywhere worth their weight would have ever come back with that type of a recommendation. It says, you know, slave laborers is going to be hot this summer. <laughs> and uh, and genocide is just like on the up in the market, you know. <laughs> but... For myself, I really appreciate what you said because, uh, you know, I didn't go to business school. I went to art school. Right? Mm-hmm. So it took me a long time to be able to understand sort of the Stanford MBA perspective, you know, the, the, the uh, Ivy League industry perspective that, that it really is centralized out of Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. It drives mm-hmm. a lot of the rest of the world. I was looking at it more as a, an art form of expression. And so if you look at history and art forms of expression, we have, of course, you know, it starts with plays and Shakespeare, and then eventually you have uh, uh, silent movies and you have uh, albums recorded on clay. You have all this stuff and music, basically uh, finite format uh, entertainment <coughs> into television, into films, that uh, the ones that had the most profound impact on me and the ones that had been, you know, if you were into the, in, around the 80s and 90s, the biggest successes that had the longest uh, fan base, you know, look at Blade Runner, right? How long ago did that come out? That came out when I was in high school right. and everyone knows what Blade Runner is. You know, there was only one, right? It wasn't like a whole bunch of cheap knockoff skin, but it, it had that much potency. And th- again, you know, not a film designed by a marketing department. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like Apocalypse Now wasn't, you know, or uh, Clockwork Orange wasn't, sure. and, <clears throat> or the novels of George Orwell, right? Uh, you know, Animal Farm, 1984. These, this, to me, as a creator, I was looking at this more like a screenwriter, less as a marketer, and more as what, what, where is the world today? Where is the world that is this demographic? What are they experiencing? Not in a purchase pattern but in a life pattern. Where is their psychology? How are they feeling? And really, you know, the only true uh, barometer we have to that is our own, right? What did we, how did we feel? What did we go through? And uh, in my experiences, I I had a lot of uh, upbringing that kind of left me feeling pretty small and hopeless in the world, quite frankly. And it wasn't that I had bad parents or anything. It was that my dad was nuclear submarines uh, around 17 years. And so as a little kid, I had this whole wide, pretty wide understanding of global thermonuclear war, <laughs> you know, by the time most kids understood Santa Claus, I understood that, and because dad wasn't home for Christmas, 
Mm. So you're, you're trying to comprehend these ideas. You're living in a world at the time that was the Cold War. And it gave me a different perspective uh, on a lot of things because, A, I didn't see my father a lot. But, B, when we did, we'd go fishing. And I was in New England. And fishing became that place, so being out in the outdoors, uh, and to us fishing meant really hiking, you know, really getting out there, whether it be boats or, or you know, put on your hiking boots for a few days, go camping for a couple of weeks out in the middle of nowhere. And that's where I found a great amount of peace, and I really related to the nature around me. And then, of course, like when I saw Star Wars, I was like, I get it, man, it's Yoda. You know, it's all about Yoda. And, you know, we're Jedis. Like, I just, I, that resonated with me at a spiritual level where none of the re religions were. You know, just like, not a chance, man. They turned me off so fast that I, I was this, you know, very, as I would say, militant materialistic mindset of, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, sort of staunch, I believe in science type of atheist. Uh -huh. And, um, but in nature, I was seeing this whole different sort of connection, and it didn't really resonate as much with, with Dar clinical Darwinianism. It more resonated with the idea that seemed like what Darwin had versus what all these clowns that follow in his footsteps had. Uh -huh. and their outlook, you know, I'm thinking of like Richard Dawkins and guys like that. You know, sure. the know-it-alls of the world that think anyone who has an experience more special than them is a, a, a delusional candidate. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, uh, I'm familiar with that. Yeah, so I've had a lot of experiences that just can't be explained with the scientific model and for whatever reasons, but a lot of those took place in nature. So I had this dichotomy between uh, growing up, looking at the world in a very, um, my, fa my father used to say, future wars will be fought over water. And so as a little kid, you know, being connected to water, I was paying attention to a lot of things and I saw a lot of fish uh, go extinct in local uh, rivers, uh, crabs, uh, and I saw my favorite lakes in Vermont, uh, they died of acid rain. And when we understood that, that was largely like, you know, from factories in the Midwest and China, you know, bringing over coal and, and uh, different types of pollutants. So it made the world a very small place to understand. And at the same time, we had this, you know, as you're, as a kid, I, I, I didn't have money. You know, our family certainly didn't have money. And in the Northeast and cold weather, I like to say, you know, cold gives you a lot of ambition. <laughs> you know, if I grew up out here in California with these guys, man, I would have been a total loser. You know, I admit it right off. I would have been smoking pot at the beach, getting the girls surfing, doing all the stuff that, you know, you are not going to do in December in New England. You know? Yeah, exactly. And uh, so it, it, get, it gave me this outlook as a creator where it was like, what, what pulled me through the most difficult periods in life? You know, and it wasn't that I had some um, counsel that I could go to, you know, real parents that were very understanding or something. I was working out through like listening to Pink Floyd or, you know, starting to read philosophers, uh, contemporary uh, political criticism, you know, just different things where I was like, you know what, I just read this guy who had this amazing analysis on Reaganomics and global control and he sounds right, <laughs> you know, like it makes more sense than all this other bullshit I hear on the news. And, and so I just started to have this very different perspective and associating that with art and that art uh, like we, we hear in the game business a lot, this is not an art form, this is a business, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very fiscally responsible thing for a business person to say. However, it is an art form, and it does have a lot of power, And but we have to look at it that way. We could have said that about music, you know? We could have never recorded soul or blues, you know? Mm -hmm. We could have never gone down in the cotton fields and started capturing some of what was happening. And there was no marketability to that. It was just, wow, listen to this, look at that, L listen to these people struggle, you know, and that made the greatest ages, uh, music of the ages, and that mm -hmm. made the greatest novels of the ages, and that's made the greatest films of the ages. So what about video games, man? When you were looking at video games, I was looking at in the early 1990s and convincing my partner, Sherry McKenna, who was the best uh, legendary executive producer in computer graphics, um, the, with a whole history of you know titles and wars and stuff like that, but I was like, this person actually knows how to manage. This person actually knows how to manage the money, the client, mm -hmm. and I, so I'm trying to convince her to do computer graphics, and she has no interest. And I'm like, look, look, look. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> I'm trying to convince her to do games, and she, and I'm like, look, think of this. This is how much mind share is going into the U.S. mind space mm -hmm. next year in video games. This many people are playing. This many hours a day. This many hours a week. This many. Hours, Sixty. This is 1992. Sixty billion hours of U.S. mindshare going into video games. And I'm like, that's like saying it's the, the majority of the diet of this country for media is becoming this interactive medium of which no one's actually looking at it. That, that's an overstatement. People have. They just didn't survive. Right? <laughs> no one's looking at it in a nutritious way. 
Mm -hmm. Like, why is this something that's heart moving? Why is this something that when I play it, it's going to have an effect on me like Apocalypse Now had, where I don't forget it for the rest of my life because it was that human, humanly meaningful, not just a great challenge that occupied 100 hours of my, of my expendable time. Mm -hmm. And so I had this different outlook, and I was looking at it more like, <clears throat> and, and gathering people around me that I felt were more like, looking at it kind of more like a band, you know, more like we're going to make music, man. Let's make great music, you know, and we had this faith that if we do that in a way that resonates outside of the market. Now, at the same time, we're sort of switching hats between like noble artist idea and like pure capitalist, you know, like, OK, and if we do that, this should be really good because, you know, it'd be like we're exploring new property and let's think of it like Spaniards you know <laughs> if we get to put a big flag on Oddworld and say we own it you know then uh, maybe there's this possibility to nurture it into something big and long term like Jim Henson did like George mm -hmm. Lucas did like Walt Disney did like Hanna Barbera did like mm -hmm. Dr. Seuss did and that's how I looked at games and and so I wasn't coming at it from oh there's this this uh this market segment that I think we can hit that I think really smart guys do come at it that way, you know, like Riot Games, you know, or, or uh, Bioware. Uh, I think they had a little more analysis in how they look at what they're picking and choosing to develop and more market statistics to support their story. Whereas I was coming from it like, you know, I just think people really want something different and more meaningful and they love beauty. You know, we really love beauty. I love beauty. I'm, I'm a, uh, any gorgeous graphics I'm usually capturing, taking a picture of. My library is enormous. And then uh, just give you an example. Here's the library. Oh, wow. Right. This is just books over the years. Forty-five and awesome skeletons. <laughs> oh yeah. Some of the, well, you need your skeletons, right? Two groundhogs fighting and uh, alligators and <laughs> monitor lizards. But that's a collection of books because, like, I am an absolute fiend for uh, collecting reference and being attracted to like beauty and art. There was an artist, Jack Goldstein, in the '80s. He since died. But he was one. Of, he made the most profound, gorgeous paintings. That just you know, twelve foot canvases to stand in front of. <laughs> wow! I mean, they were really powerful in all the top museums in the world. Mm. And he was talking about beauty. You know, like what happened? Why do we have to kill beauty? Why does art today? You know, on, is it only beautiful if it's selling a package? But this idea that's got to become ugly to be art. And so I was in this realm of like, we can we can talk about really object ugly subjects in a really sort of broken, twisted, funny bone way, which I was thinking was like X Files meets. Uh, uh, the Muppets, you know, <laughs> and and so we could talk about these really grim possibilities that are really inspired by activity happening in the 20th century, mm -hmm. not things that happened a thousand years ago, not buying into the bullshit of these of these uh, bullshit wars we fight, not not any of that. But let's get closer to what's really affecting people. And when I looked at that, I was what was affecting me was looking at the the environment, how many how many species were going extinct a year, how, how many uh, habitats were being destroyed. And as a fly fisherman, uh, one of the great things about the success that I've had that I'm really grateful for is I, I was able to fly all over the world fly fishing. And there's nowhere, I can tell you, and I've been you know, closer, closer to the, the North Pole, you know, up in Alaska and, and out into the various uh, you know, remote areas like Bora Bora or the Great Barrier Reef or you know, a aspects of the Caribbean. And uh, it's all not what it was, you know. Mm -hmm. This is this is this is a pretty impacted world, and I didn't see those issues really being dealt with. They're certainly not talked in the news, except in a bullshit way. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I'm like, how do I reinterpret this into a modern mythology? Because what I came to believe is that it was like the power of myth, right? If anyone who's ever watched the Joseph Campbell series. And I was such a fan of Star Wars that I was just trying to digest anything I could find of George Lucas, any biographies, any material. And then my dad sent me, when he was still alive, The Power of Myth. When I was in college and I started watching that video series, the interview with Bill Moyers uh, with uh, Joseph Campbell at Lucas's library up at the ranch, uh, which is about uh, 20 miles north of here, you know, the... Uh, that interview series completely blew my mind because I loved Star Wars, you know, the first three movies on, on such a such a deep level. Like I, I was just so appreciative of it and inspired by it. And my dad, one of the first books that really made me think I could actually get into entertainment was he gave me the artist Star Wars book back in the, in the 70s. And it was like, oh, you know, the first time, like, look at these drawings, look at this art, you know, making that wonderful film. So I was really excited about it on, on a relatively superficial level. And then I watched that series. Again, I was in high school. And, and 
uh, I was just beginning college, and I was starting to be, oh my God, he had so many working mechanisms about mythology, about culture, about time, you know, what, what period of civilization you live in that he was playing with in those movies that ultimately developed those stories and developed those images. And that was so inspiring to me that I was like, wh where is that spot today? Mm -hmm. And if I was, just to sum it up, if I was to listen to, uh, if I were to summarize in a soundbite the deficit that I think Star Wars found for the mid-1970s was it was really, it wasn't there was a deficit for sci-fi. Mm. There was a deficit, a deficit for spirituality. Mm. And what had happened is the, the world's churches are failing people at, an, at, a, at, a, at a really inspiring rate, you know, which is, you know, you see just flocks of migrations leaving these big institutional churches. And for, probably for good damn reason, right? But... And, and so this was happening in a major way in the 70s. And at the same time, you had this kind of overly woo-woo-y new ageism that was emerging and turning off a lot of people that were really smart uh, because of the way it's talked about. And then it, or it's getting like, you know, so far out there, Buddhism sit under the year for your rest of your uh, sit under the tree for 20 years and then you'll get it. You know, that wasn't working for people that lived in New York that were are doing financial transactions, you know, or working in advertising. I, I can't go sit under a tree for, tree for 20 years. Sure. So... What I think was that he, with that property, hit a spiritual deficit that was taking place at a sort of global level. And you were, you were in this tug, tug of war between, you know, completely flaky, woo-woo-y New Ageism, completely staunch sort of uh, uh, various literal interpretations or orthodox views of, of ancient religions, or staunch science that says, you know, there's nothing, and we're just a lightning bolt to hit a pile, a pile of... Uh, uh, tidal pool, you know, three billion years ago, and, and this is just a fire that's never gone out. We call it life. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't much of a really intelligent dialogue happening, in my opinion, mm -hmm. in, the, in the sort of public consciousness. And I think Star Wars really resonated in that way where people have a very strong connection to nature. And this is being proven on like neuroscience levels now. There's a group called, called Blue Mind. It's a group of neuroscientists and ocean biologists that are measuring like health differences of just people who look at the ocean every day versus people who don't. And mm -hmm. why are we willing to pay 50% more for a sandwich if it has a view of an ocean where we eat it? So the economics of the psyche relationship between man and nature. And it's deeper than we'd like to admit. And we are it, right? We're just a, we've become our own perversion of it. So for me, I was like, now, okay, if he hit a sort of spiritual gap that related to just good and bad and concepts of connected to nature in the 1970s, where are we at 20 years later in the mid-1990s? And I thought the equivalent sort of reflection of that was more globalism. And, you know, Star Wars is certainly about globalism, right? The Empire is absolutely inspired by the IMF, <laughs> you know, by the World Bank. And yeah. anyone who understands the real histories of these organizations understands why. And it's not talked about on the LA Times, right? It's not talked about on the Huffington Post. And it's not talked about on the uh, New York Times. But it's real. And anyone who does their homework can find out pretty quickly. But my point being is I thought these themes in a world today where I mean, in 94, we didn't even have really, pe most people didn't know what WWW meant, right? Mm -hmm. They were still just emerging. So we didn't have access to a lot of knowledge. And I was thinking, you know, I, I, but I think people are really feeling, you know, their jobs gone. And in other countries, you know, I was looking at people still being, their middle management had M16s. And they were, you know, working naked in diamond mines, uh, you know, getting, getting the finger at the end of the day to see if they're sneaking anything out. I mean, like, those were their jobs. That was basic survival. And as I related to that, I thought, I thought, and animal testing, like a lot of these things that, that just pull on the heartstrings. And I said, but these issues are really deeper to our sort of lost civilization. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the youth is, is tapped to that thread, whether or not they're really cognitive of it or not. And that's what I think Star Wars did. Like, it was cool seeing, seeing Jedi uh, ships fly around, mm -hmm. but listening to that connection of nature, you know, trusting the Force, I think, I think young people just really resonated with something about that that might be more, more about us than not. And they weren't hearing that anywhere else. And uh, so that's a long-winded answer as to sort of what was ultimately driving the stories of Oddworld, why I thought they'd have an international... Uh, uh, independent of language, you know, independent of culture, that they'd resonate and uh, 
uh, the more aware you were in the world, maybe the more you'd get into the property. But even if you weren't and you just enjoyed it, we should make it really endearing. You know, Muppets meets the X-Files. You might be dealing with some super heavy themes if you get it, but you don't have to get it for it to be a fun, entertaining experience. And at the end of the day, don't take yourself too seriously. You know, we're not making documentaries. There's a reason why documentaries don't make as much money as blockbusters. Yeah. And uh, But if you can find that mix, and this is what I think Kubrick did brilliantly, Steel, Spielberg actually does pretty brilliantly, you know, depending on the film. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the great artists that have made the real memorable stuff that affected my life, I think that's where they were always coming from. And, uh, and that's what drove Oddworld. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, and how did it do when Oddworld came out in 94? Uh, I wasn't uh, in touch with how games sold. There was no way to find out. But it was certainly getting talked about, and it, it immediately resonated with me, and a lot of people I know played it and, and were excited about. You just had this feeling when you played it that this is a new direction for video games. This is a maturation of video games. It was the 90s. It was CD-ROM. It was, I can't believe that they can pull off these graphics, of course, but that was something we were used to seeing. On top of that, it was like they're willing to give me these themes of uh, look at how marketing is probably killing you and look at how <laughs> the things you're putting in your body might be killing you. And you, you can, as uh, someone who's budding into adulthood, wake up to this fact. It just as Dean as mm -hmm. kind of wakes up to the fact that I'm, I'm a slave, but I don't have to be and, and, and rebels against that. To me, all the themes were just, you know, ding, 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 just uh, right on all the things that were... Uh, in my life, just hitting all the bullet points there. But I, but I, at the same time, was afraid, like, well, this isn't a cute platformer game, and I know those sell, and I know it's not a, a particularly violent power fantasy game, and I knew those sell as a, as a teenager. So back then, I was worried. How did it, how, <laughs> yeah, so was the person who made it? How did it? How did it end up? Uh, how was it received when it first came out? It it, it did really well uh, uh, in the scheme of things. I think we sold about three and a half million units, you know, at the shelf. Sure. And. Uh, uh, and I was at the end of the day, you know, some of them probably in the bargain bin at the end of the day, but uh, so not at full price, but that's that's about how many units it turned then. And it, it was a real, it was really a bet that we took that that would resonate. But the fact is, no one. If I went in there as a pitch, as a PowerPoint, and said, this is the game I want to make, and I spent too much time talking about it, I don't think it would have turned people on. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think someone would have financed the idea. So we really got financed on a different set of skills. It was that if you go back in time, and I think this is important to young people to understand who want to be making their own games and stuff, timing is a lot of it. The timing and conditions of an industry is a lot of it. And the timings and conditions that I was waiting for to start a game company was... Uh, Waiting for CD-ROM, meaning meaning the the I I was coming out of an expertise in in uh, film and television of 3D computer graphics, film and television, and actually aerospace engineering was where I had spent that time before, and so we had 3D down. I mean, we were doing you know right up there. Our I was at Rhythm and Hughes. I was a visual effects supervisor. By the time I left, our main competitor was ILM. I mean, we were playing. You know, the last movie that was in the, the shop when I was there was uh, Babe. They won the Academy Award. Oh wow! This is serious. It was serious stuff. We had a lot of experience in computer graphics. My wife did the Last Starfighter, uh, you know, 2010, like these movies. Wow. That were, yeah, she did that. Those movies. <laughs> yeah, so that was all computed on the Cray, you know, the yeah. Cray XMP, which was like 12 million dollars. So she's got the stories of her convincing Seymour Cray that it would be better to donate the a uh, a machine to making movies that his mom would be proud of rather than making bombs that she's probably not you know so there's all these great backside stories of what happened in early computer graphics but anyway the point is is that at the time if you remember if you were watching the industry at all there was a company called Rocket Science and they just came out about 2 years before we did and they pulled together a story for Wall Street really that went like this games is changing and now they're going to go 3D and productions are going to get much more expensive, and basically it's going to become Sillywood, the marriage between Hollywood and Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And the pipelines are going to be faster, and Trip Hawkins has got this new game machine called the 3DO, and it is just going to blow your mind. Now, I had been in simulation, you know, in the 80s, right? I knew what the computing capacity was. I knew the 3DO wasn't going to do shit in terms of 3D graphics. But, uh, you know, it was like Sky Fox, you know. Everyone's like, oh, Sky Fox, 3D flying simulator. And I was like, I was already flying F-14 simulators and, you know, $12 million mechanisms networked, like, years before that. So I had an idea of what it was going to take. Mm -hmm. And 
so I heard all this buzz, and it was the buzz that was perfect because something they were saying was big teams, big budgets, much more difficult management. The game industry doesn't know how to do it. We're pulling together Hollywood. We're pulling together uh, uh, software developers. We're pulling together production designers. We're pulling together people from ILM. And that's what they did. And they, they on a story, they went out and went public and raised like $40 million. And, uh, but they hadn't produced anything, just basically a resume and a story. And so I saw this, and it wasn't stupid. <laughs> I was like, look at these guys just got $40 million on a story. We've got a good story, too. Um, you know, it's a little weak, but we can go patch it up. Now, the thing was, was that I loved games, and I'm inherently really insecure about stuff I don't know. Like, I, I might have a big mouth, but I try not to talk about shit I really don't know much about. So I was desperately trying to learn about games. And some of the guys that were the most generous to me before I got into business was uh, uh, Tommy Talrico down at uh, Virgin and Dave Perry. Like those were people that were like, hey, you know, oh, you do awesome. You know, you guys do great computer graphics. Let's just let us show you how we do games. And at the time, this is like Aladdin on Sega, you mm. know, Genesis. And I was just like for the first time seeing guys implementing more cell, cell shaded uh, type of, uh, this is before Earthworm Jim, right? The first games that were doing that Disney animation style at Virgin that was going to wind up on a Sega a SNES. And I was seeing how little memory they had to work with, and I was, I was really trying to get my head around exactly the craft that they do. And, and what that gave me was an insight to say, this is a mastery science. Mm -hmm. This is really a very, very, very difficult discipline. Forget what the graphics look like. Because if you were doing the graphics we did, we, we were spending a night to render a frame. I mean, like hours for a frame, you know, Mil on million-dollar computers with eight processors, we'd, we'd be chugging these things for weeks. And here these guys are using 56K memory and, and a little bit of bits of that, you know, and, and just like making an experience that to me what was the most mind-blowing was that they weren't making a million dollars a minute of footage, which is what we were char charging for a million dollars for a f minute of footage that once we delivered it would always be a minute of footage. It would never change. It would never change in story, it was static media. And in games, I was like, wow, they're creating maybe a minute of content, but then they're turning that into a several hour experience. Mm -hmm. Now that in and of itself was something to make me as a sort of technologist, artist, and, and futurist, which is I, I guess what I would consider myself sort of futurist, is I was like, this is miraculous because we're getting out of the static confines of what constitutes media. Never before were we able to experience something that we could keep on experiencing, but the, the input of content is not increasing. It's cycling it. You know, a guy walking left in 18 frames in a movie is half a second. But a guy walking left in 18 frames in a video game is a guy that can walk left forever as long as the person's pushing left. You know, it, like motion code really opened my mind. And so I was thinking, huh, then maybe we can make like 16 to 20 minutes of linear content or maybe 40 minutes in terms of if you added up every cycle of animation and all your FMVs and all that stuff. Maybe we can do that, but, but in an engine that can play them back and create a 30 to 60 hour experience. This is, this is essentially what the game makers were already doing. And to me, this was like alchemy. It was like, wow, man, we can do less footage and have longer media experiences. And look at this, into a market that's doing 60 billion hours of mindshare a year. Now, what if we think about this more as, you know, like film auteurs? What if we think about this more as it's a medium of legacy that, that isn't just trying to give you a good challenge for your pleasure like toy industry was doing? Mm -hmm. And in many ways, the game industry was emulating the toy industry, right? It's no surprise that Nolan Bushnell uh, founded Atari and then went on to found Chuck E. Cheese. It's like it, was, it was actually very close in thinking in my mind. But it wasn't being approached as a medium as, you know, thinking about it the way that Kubrick would. And, uh, and at, at the time, I think a lot of the good storytellers, they were just too into storytelling than to want to suffer the pain of understanding the compromise of games. Mm -hmm. and, and I tell this to people all the time, and I tell it to, to the big film directors who think they're going to get in here and make a difference, is I go, look, when you're on a film set, you get to be the master of the set. You get to scream. You can be James Cameron. You can be a total asshole. And yell and scream enough, and if you got the power, you'll get your result. But this is games. It's not going to work that way. Because here you have companies, not crews, right? On a film, there's all these different sort of dynamics, you know, bureaucratic and political dynamics, industry dynamics. In films, they pull together 
hundreds of people, they get together, you know, shooting for six weeks or so, and then they go away, right? And people go, man, that guy was an asshole to work with. I hope I don't get called for that job again. But they're on to another production. They're on to another thing. Games didn't work that way. Games was, it's one company of people. That culture becomes very important. You can't have some disruptive asshole into that culture screaming and yelling and getting his way because I guarantee someone is going to start basically, for lack of a better word, sabotaging that code. <laughs> you know? You'd be like, gee, you know, we're just not making our day. You know, just must not be. I guess we got more bugs. You know what I mean? Like, no one can get you like coders if they got it in for you, right? So good luck to the, the screaming auteurs when they want to get and deal with teams of coders that are going to deliver their game. <clears throat> this is much more of a team sport. You don't get to scream down and get your results where you can just fire the DP, fire the lead engineer, fire whoever you want as soon as they give you backlip. You can't do that in this space. You will not succeed because this is a space of mastery of compromise. And that's really what you're trying to figure out. That's really what you're trying to master is where can I hide all the compromise? How do I do this clever? And the more build games you build, I think the more this is whether you grasp it cognitively or whether you're just doing it subconsciously, which I think most of the industry is. If you don't understand that dance, you will never succeed in games because games is all compromise. You know, you might have a big vision, but it's pulling it off with the time and resources and the, and the little sort of voodoo-y like science that we do to make these experiences run that hopefully people haven't played before, right? So it's got to be a new experience, and that's, mm -hmm. that's what it's about. But uh, so all of that being said, uh, we had the success coming out of the gate uh, and a lot of lessons too. You know, we learned a lot. So in the beginning, it was about, you know, Abe was our bestseller at about three and a half million units, but he also, he had a great marketing uh, support. He had a, a, a lot of uh, corporate support at the time of the publisher, GT. So there was a lot of things going in his direction. And, you know, like I said, I was watching these tides turn, and I saw that we could get the money, and I tried to educate myself in games fast enough to be able to basically not be full of shit when I'm standing in front of a room full of people trying to convince them to give us money. And I actually had a pretty good rap on games at that time. And people who knew games would say, guy's got a pretty good rap. Guy seem, that guy seems like he's got a lot of vision for this. But the fact of the matter was I had a lot of hard lessons to go. I mean, I had a lot of ideas, and then I had a lot of uh, schools at hard knocks, you know, to, to figure out how lofty those ideas versus how practical they were. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the industry was changing in that 2D... Uh, 2D graphics were on the way out, but so was 2D gameplay. Abe, Abe yeah, and yeah. Over. And before long, you had to cope with the amount of compromises that come with exploring a 3D space and the amount of freedom you give to the player while still trying to guide them along a path that will express your vision. When you were talking about the compromise of, of making games, it, it, my mind was suddenly getting boggled and like being terrified to ever be in a position like you where you're not only having to compromise with your team, but it, you have to envision, well, I'm going to be compromising with the player. I'm going to want the player to have a specific experience because I've got this vision. I'm so excited about it. That's right. But they want control too, and I have to make sure that they feel like they're in control, so they're going to be uh, guiding the experience in the way they want to, but hopefully still along the path that I'm, I'm setting for them that they feel too led along the path, they're going to feel like it's not an interactive experience and drop it. So, oh, God, that's what you were, that's where you're up against. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's, and that's just one slice of it, right, of which there are many that are all kind of asking a related question and they're all hitting you with, with more and more, you know, concrete realities that are either going to break you or, or you or you learn how to bend to. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's really tricky. And, and when I look at, you know, guys like Notch, uh, and his team, you know, developing like Minecraft. I see, or Will, you know, Will Wright developing Sims. Uh, I see people doing things that I myself would probably never be able to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I mean that in a complimentary way, meaning, you know, I come at this, I was trained as a painter. So I, I was trained as a photorealist. I tend to look at things a different way. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I don't look at things as much as in a... Uh, a science way, uh, which I would say The Sims is very, uh, very much sort of algorithmically driven, right, in possibilities, and as was SimCity, uh, these more simulations, and then Minecraft is really a, uh, a, an exercise of, of a brilliant narrowing of the smallest possible tool set for widest possible uh, player expression. 
And, and I, I guess that's how I would sum it up, you know, it, it, fairly ignorantly as I'm not a player, right? But when I look at that, I'll go, I'll never master that science as well as these guys. Uh, but I'm after something different, you know, and hopefully that's something different. There's a, there's a market for that, that that stands up because, like I was saying, like I believe in, you know, when you think about 2001, when you think about Apocalypse Now, right, the, the or the new, what's uh, Aronofsky's new film? Uh, Ooh, which one? What's he on now? The, the brand new one. It's out right now with... Uh, uh, they're going into space. I want to oh, say Trent. Oh, is that Aronofsky or is that Nolan? Inter Interstellar. Nolan. Nolan. Sorry. Yeah. Christopher Nolan. My bad. Oh, that's all right. Close enough. Yeah. And uh, I was thinking of Noah. <laughs> Aronofsky <laughs> did Noah, right? But uh, uh, when when we watch someone's movies like that, there there are moments that are just so gorgeous. And there's something about the human being that is mesmerized by beauty, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the – what did Einstein say? Relativity, relativity is – uh, I put my hand on a burner, on a lit burner, and uh, a second feels like a million years. But uh, I'm sitting next to a beautiful girl, and a minute, and and and, it, and I'm, you know, it, an hour goes by, a minute goes by. But it, yeah, it, it's yeah. the inverse, and I'm saying it really bad. No, but uh, I could be there for ten hours, but it only felt like I was there for ten seconds, right? Mm -hmm. Just the, the awe. And I've heard so many people say, "Oh, uh, he." he or she was just so beautiful. I, I was just speech, speechless, you know? And sunrises have effects. Sunsets have that effect where people are just, just stop and look at that, you know? And uh, great filmmakers have that in spades. Great photographers understand this in spades. Uh, the artists that I used to work with, they talked about the, re the reductive power of beauty. And meaning that if you can make something so capturing that people essentially just absorb into the ride, you know, then uh, sometimes those the opening shots of Prometheus, if you saw that movie recently, you know, I think they're flying in over Iceland or something, you know, it looks like the beginning of the week billion years ago, is uh, that, that in a storytelling context, there's a lot of room for the power of beauty. And, and uh, so for myself, I was always like focused more as a narrative storyteller, trying to create more interactivity that allowed us to stay on a main story thread, but allowed us to play and experience it with, you know, some degree of choice mm -hmm. and options. Uh, but it did make the games that we made, it made them more story adventure games. It wasn't a game where, you know, you could build a level 50,000 times and always share it with your friends and it would be different and you create communities and forums to talk about it in the same way. It wouldn't have that type of, of experience, but it might be very profound and lasting. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to people, you know, most people uh, that experience that they remember Abe. You know, they, they, you know, this is 17 years later, they remember Abe. And, and as, even as I go forward, I'm searching for a, uh, a better chemistry of true chemistry, which I think would go into the Sims Minecraft class, uh, and even, uh, of, of course, more, maybe the MMO uh, class at greater sort of hierarchical trees, you know, skill trees. Uh, evolving, but searching for more of where does story meet chemistry in a better way, in a more open-ish world kind of way. And then you get into things like Grand Theft Auto and they do it like pretty incredibly, you know, uh, in terms of people just getting sidetracked into their own stories, even though there's still main thread that they could be following. Uh, and I'm, I'm searching for that balance better too, but I, I want to put you into worlds that can sort of reduce you by their intensity, you know, reduce your like awe experience. And I tell you, we had some of these awe experiences just recently, not, not us making it, but uh, me and a crew were down at uh, the Oculus Connect conference recently. Mm -hmm. And they were showing, I don't know if you heard anything about this, but they were showing a particular demo set called Crescent Bay. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, basically, uh, we've got a few Oculus sets here, the, the DK2, the second uh, generation. Oh, cool. Uh, this is, excuse me. Oh, I said, oh, cool. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we, as a medium, uh, I don't know how deep you've tested some of the latest stuff, but the Crescent Bay stuff was basically like Oculus Dev Kit 3.0, except they don't call it that, and it's probably not going to ship like that. Hmm. But it's better screen technology, better sensing ability, you know, full range of head, you know, full range forward. And, and uh, you know, you're not seeing the pixels on the screen anymore. It's totally running. 60 to 120 hertz. I don't know. They've addressed a lot of sciences, but they had about eight to ten demo, ten or twelve demos that, that ran in there, and they blew your mind. 
And I just read an interview with uh, Cameron recently where he said, eh, it's not there yet. Uh, you know, how long can you do this? How you, and, I, and I just read it in a way he has not tried Crescent Bay demos. Ah. Because they are, no one walks out and goes, eh, it's not there yet. No one. No one. And there's a demo that was built by Valve, just as an example, that it just pop, pops on, you know, and you're in your headset. And... Uh, let me just first say the big difference in good VR, which the public has not had a chance to, to sample yet, I guarantee you this, not had a sample, I don't, I, I don't care. I don't care what they've used. They haven't done what was being shown in LA a few weeks back. And when you put that on your head, the big, real super clear thing that it happens is scale is no longer behind the screen. It's <laughs> If it's a 60-foot dinosaur walking towards you, it's a 60-foot dinosaur walking to you, and I'm only six feet tall, and I'm like, holy shit, man. You know, I'm looking up there, I'm looking at his head. I look down here, I'm looking at his feet, and he's moving, you know. And when he walks over, you're like, ah. There was a, so scale is a total game changer because it's real now. And no matter how many monitors you have around you, it's behind the glass. But what happens when it's done well and, and, and running on the right technology Designed right, the, the the software designed for that device correctly, and that's where a lot of people are going to get it wrong. We're going to have a lot of headaches in these things, mm -hmm. but when it's done right, it is a, so convincing that this was happening. There was a demo by Valve, and Valve was really at the forefront of this whole VR effort, right, in, in their lab up there in Seattle, and you you it comes on, and you're looking out at a steampunk like city. Right. And you're like, wow, man, you know, there's blimps going by, you know, and it's rendered like with Valve's best tech, so it looks damn good. And uh, and then you look down, and you see that you're standing right on the ledge of about the 40 or the 60th story. And you know 100% that you're in a room with a totally safe floor around you, and there's a person standing right next to you, you know. You're in a perfectly safe environment. But... You look down in the slight a millimeter drift of your head this way or that way, and all the multiplanning between your feet and the street is it's perfect. And it's instantaneous. A millimeter this way, a millimeter that. So any waver, it's all real, all your perspective, all your par parallaxing is totally convincing. And and the person usually says, you know, yeah, look down. And you're like, oh my God. And you can hear other people in another booth going, oh my God, this is sick. You know, and they're like going off. But you look down, and I can tell you that I could not step out into off the ledge, right? Now, I've been dealing with computer graphics for 30 years. That's what I do, I build virtual worlds. I understand them from the inside out. I know 1,000% that that's 100% fake imagery that I'm looking at. I know 100%. My brain knows that there's a floor in front of my foot, but I couldn't step out, right? Now, think about that. Now, that is a very common experience for people going into that that have been in this industry forever. They're like, I, 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 my brain knew that I could do it, but my body would not do it. It's so convincing and it so overtakes your senses. It's so powerful when it's, when it's done right that we haven't dealt with things like this before. It's a total game changer. I mean, this is the big changer that's coming. But the point being is that it takes technology to that next leap. And in that leap, uh, we want to play in that leap, not necessarily with the Oddworld brand yet, but we're certainly dabbling. And we want to make experiences that just absolutely transport people. And we don't have a bunch of metrics to go by. We, don't have, we can't say shooters are going to do well. What we can say in VR is shooters do not do well. Okay, mm -hmm. Call of Duty is not going to do well in VR. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and Oculus will tell you this, and anyone who's got their finger on a pulse will tell you it's, it's, it's game-changing. It's, You've got to rethink how people interact with stuff. And where we're looking, one of the reasons we're looking at the, the VR space is that it really is that, you know, I always wanted to do bigger creatures in games, you know, and due to time and, and, and the compromised science, uh, I never got to put really big creatures in the odd world, you know, like they were putting into, uh, 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 what's the Japanese guys from the part two of Ico? Um, oh, uh, Shadow of the Clock. Yeah. yeah, like Shadow of the Colossus, you know, or even uh, God of War, you know, or, you know, and more and more games do it over and over. Uh, but I, I always wanted to get those big characters, you know. But no matter what, it was still like making paintings where you're you're dealing with the composition. If I want a guy to a monster to be really big, right, and then I have a got to have a guy in the foreground to give you some scale depth. Not in VR. Mm. In VR, if he's really big, you're gonna be, <laughs> you know, I mean, it is incredible. So. Uh, I look at this because it, it, it's, it's another place where we said, like, 
2D was fading out, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we came in with a 2D game that played back 3D rendered sprites. And then as people went 3D, we had to deal with how do you do, how do you explore worlds? How do you not get lost? How do you shape a narrative story and let people have 360 degrees of where they can run around? All these are problems. We get into the next space. We have new sets of problems. And a lot of the old gameplay ideas are just going to completely break down. It's like mm -hmm. that, that understanding that worked really well uh, for, for action console gaming and stuff like that. Rethink it. Just read it because it's that different and it's that powerful. It's that over-consuming. Yeah. Is is that why shooters are not thought to be something that's going to be a good fit with this really next-level VR, which sounds like it's triggering the parts of the brain, the amygdala and the hippocampus that that go on fight or flight by just walking around, like let alone getting <laughs> shot at. So uh, my immediate guess would be like, no, it's going to be, it's just going to be uncomfortably. Uh, intense to, to be in a, a hugely violent situation in a game at that level of real. I, th I think the uh, maybe if you were in a tank or in a plane, it might be okay mm -hmm. because you're very used to how the controls will go. It's very limited. It's very controlled, right? But if you get in a VR and you just start panning left, like actually just just trekking left, uh, you're going to have an instant sense of nausea. Mm -hmm. right? So any. The, the thing about Oculus that's very encouraging is that they are spending a lot in terms of bringing in great minds, great scientists, and the, you know, a number of the best programmers this industry has seen, and having them focus on the problem very much of why is the disorientation? How do we help advise developers to stay away from the disorientation factor? How do we keep improving the technology to deal with this very real issue that we know has to be dealt with? It was funny because I saw an interview the other day uh, with uh, was it Brandon I, I, I always say his last name wrong, the CEO of Oculus. Right. And uh, he said to Sony, he said, I hope you're addressing the, the nausea issue. You know, it was... Uh, I don't know how much you know crosstalk is happening in there, but it's a very real thing to say uh, because it's going to be. Look, think of it this way: there's never been a consumer electronic product that will leave you with an eight-hour, five to seven-hour headache if it was a bad piece of software. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you didn't like the game, you thought it sucked. If you didn't like the movie, you thought it sucked. You turned it off. If you don't, if if you're experiencing this and you're starting to get into it, but it's not designed well for VR assimilation and 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 uh, uh, orientation, you're going to have a pretty major headache. You know. And if you're if you've been drinking a lot, like I have no doubt, we're going to start seeing YouTube videos of kids totally chucking it up in VR, right? Because they'll be drinking and they go home and they start playing this game and they're like. Bleh, bleh, you know, it's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, so hopefully, you know, designers will get this right fast. But the, but the point being is that with different stages of technology, you have to really think about design differently. And what I'm excited about in the next generation is, is you know, we come out of a world with complex controls, right? Controllers and more buttons is better. I mean, it started simple, right? Uh, Atari and Net NES, really simple controls. And then they got more complex. You know, you got PS2s and Xbox and then keyboards for PC gaming, action gaming, you know, com totally different configure. And then mobile brought something that said two thumbs. Mm. Deal with it with two thumbs. And I think that was one of the best things to happen to gaming because it really forced designers to sort of rethink how can we? You know, how can we <laughs> simplify a great gaming experience into less controls? And, uh, you know, that was demonstrated elsewhere in, in the technology space by, like, Tony Fidel with iPod. Mm -hmm. You know, one, one, you know, a wheel and a button, right? And all of a sudden, you, you could do all these things with a simpler interface. Then we get to touchscreens. That interface has to get simpler, more simple again. And we're at that phase where, we, you know, we're going through mobile, and we're finding it has to be two thumbs or you're going to fail anything on those iPad devices. And then start, you know, taking advantage of Mercury switches. And what does that mean? And now we have this new new sort of landscape of rules that's emerged. And we see, hey, look, wow, Grand Theft Auto is playing with two thumbs. You know, mm -hmm. Stranger's Wrath releases in, in days in two, on two thumbs. Oh, it does? Yeah, Stranger's coming out on uh, iOS and Android in <laughs> just a few days. I, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, oddworld.com should cover it. That's very exciting, and and that's the second game in the series. Uh, it was the fourth one. It was, on, it was yeah, originally on the Xbox, uh, originally like uh, uh, programmed like OpenGL uh, three class graphics. So that carried over into mobile quite well. So it actually renders better on 
and uh, you know good Android devices than it did on the Xbox. Wow. Which is pretty amazing. But that was a fairly complex control screen that, that ultimately we had to figure out how to deduce it in the two thumbs. And I just stress on that point because that's what I think the future is. And in VR, uh, what becomes very apparent is you don't see a keyboard, right? So so you you don't see your controls the way you used to. And so again, it's kind of I think it's going to inherit a lot from the lessons of mobile, and yet get into richer and richer, richer, more immersive experiences. And that's something I've always, even though I did 2D uh, side scrolling games, I was always trying to like really expand that sense of depth of the world, you know. So even though Abe was running in here, which was clearly inspired by Prince of Persia and Flashback and Out of This World and even uh, 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 Blackthorn, if you remember mm -hmm. that, you know, sure. uh, Blizzard's first IP <laughs> that they got to do it. Uh, but just having that, and then I was looking at Myst at the time, and for the first time you had, in my opinion, production design that was so cool looking that you'd say, back there in 3D space, I want to go just because it looks so cool. Now, that's what we were previously experiencing in movies. Right, we'd be like, wow, the castle's off in the distance and still a long ways to go to Mordor, you know. But here, it was like, wow, this was happening in a game. So for Abe's Odyssey, it was kind of this mixture of trying to figure out how do we get that beauty pull in the distance of seeing a temple back there that we knew was in our short-term destiny, but then, you know, we could only go right and left on the screen, uh, you know, which led to a lot of design challenges, et cetera, to mm -hmm. try and capture, like, more of the, the filmic. And where we're heading next, I think, is... Not so much more the filmic, but and I mean this as a designer personally. Not that I'm, uh, uh, I'm not suggesting I'm working on a new IP at the at the minute for Oddworld. This is a, diff a different project. But what I'm most interested in is less of the cinematic and more of the fully immersive. More of you come into something that is so powerful and overwhelming, and not because you're getting shot at. You know, just just being there. That, that the intensity of just being there, could, I think, can be taken quite a few levels that we don't expect to come from media yet, and it's right around the corner. It's yeah. like it's, it's right here. And it's also something that I think five people that are really great at what they can do will have the ability to excel beyond teams of 500 that have infinite financing. Mm -hmm. And it's like that back to, you know, electric guitars just got invented, you know. It doesn't matter if you have a band of 300 people playing them. No one knows how to play it well. So two guys that do a great job with a drummer, you know, and we get, you know, or three guys with a drummer and we get the Beatles, you know. Sure. Uh, and so it's with these changes in technology comes opportunities you know, and for me in the beginning, of the change of technology was CD-ROM because if we were going to CD-ROM, then I could pre-render the 3D graphics and have another, you know, 600 megabytes to play them back from. And cartridges never held that much data. And so again, we see like these new changes in technology, changes in delivery system. You know, the the, the iPhone allowed anybody in their bedroom to become a developer as long as they were willing to download the package, and that was and and a means to actually get it to the public total game changer for the possibility of game development, right? That, that, that didn't really exist before except in PC, which meant it really wasn't exposed. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't have any central outlet exposing it like an iTunes store. Sure. An app store. But uh, I've rambled on that long enough for No, no, no. Uh, motion controls. Do you see yeah. that being a part of VR? Do you see that not being compatible? Because it, it sounds like it would solve some of the problems you wouldn't necessarily have to look at buttons or even have the lack of immersion that comes from knowing you're holding a controller while you're looking around the world, but you're not looking at the controller in that world. So you know, yeah, well, they, yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of um, so motion controls can mean a few different things, but just thinking right up front, right, uh, the immediate sort of reception of what I think you mean mm -hmm. is there's certain like once media overtakes your ex experiential input. Right. Once it completely, once you turn your head and the media is moving with you, and you're really, and it's tracking with the speed of your movements, and it's and it's that convincing. Once it gets to that level, uh, something's diff different is happening between our body and brain relationship. You know, we mil we evolved millions of years not stepping off the ledge. <laughs> right, and your so even though your brain knows it's safe to step off your ledge, it's like your body has its own mind and it goes, no, it's not. Okay. Billions of years we're here evolving, you know, and it, it's because we don't do shit like that. When it looks that way, we don't step off the ledge, you know. Right. And your body, it, it's like until you really experience VR that way, you go, wow, you know, my mind can be thinking one thing and my body has a mind of its own, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, so 
we're inevitably heading more and more into that territory, and with each of that comes new possibilities. Uh, I don't know how fast that landscape is going to take off with the VR. I think it'll be. I think it's here. It's here to stay. Uh, Oculus is going to be a, a forerunner on that. Uh, Morpheus will will uh, probably be, you know, the the second up. I, I think, you know, the the contender in this at, the, at a similar time, and I hope they do it just as well. Um, and but it is a game changer to what way? I don't really know because it's something that people look at today and go, how do we make money with it? And mm -hmm. right now there's no way to say this is how you make money because no one has an installed base. We don't know what pricing is. We don't know what duration of stay is. In a game we say, well, people are going to play you know, in two-hour spurts. Right? If it's a desktop game, if it's a mobile game, they go, out, oh, they play in five-minute spurts. Uh, in VR, we don't know how long they're going to play. Before. But VR is like a lot of work on us. you know. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited about it because of all the – the game-changing possibilities it brings into how it forces design change, evolutionary design thinking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a, as an art, that's kind of, I'm into the systems of design more. Like, how, how do we think about this, and how do we take, how do we create a big story? And if I say a big story, let's take, like, Lost, the television mm -hmm. show. You know, it, it was an enormous story, but you, you, you just land on an island in a plane crash. You don't know what the hell's going on. How does that happen uh, where... You're not just uncovering emissions, but you're actually learning more about a world that's relevant to you, but you're finding it in a way that has more chemistry to it, that, that allows you more, uh, more things to do in that world that, that, that keep you going and keep you occupied, but at the same time do it outside of the science that we've come to understand equals good challenge, because that was good challenge behind the screen. And now that we're in the screen, and that's really the, the whole, whole difference, right? We're in that world now. Uh, it, it brings a lot of other challenges. And you're going to see, like, some of the stuff that looks the coolest there, you would never think it does. Like, some people, uh, I'm, I'm not recalling exactly who, but there was, like, a little HO train set running on a tabletop. And you got to sort of look around, you know, and you could put, and there's a little fire truck, like, in cartoony graphics, uh, 3D cell shaded ish graphics. And it's putting out a little fire and a little high rise. It's all stylized. And little planes taking off from the airport, you know, but you never would have thought that just a tabletop of what looks like an HO train set with a little more life in it would be so intriguing to look at from a true God's point of view, you know, God's eye point of view, where you're just like looking down and it's truly miniature, you know, and you're just like, wow, it's so, I think that the possibilities are, are kind of endless where the, the flat screen you know, our graphics is up to par now where if you see a sports game in a sports bar, you're not sure if it's television or the game. Mm. Right, like like we we've, we've we're hitting that barrier of what we can get out of the screen, and so they're just selling them now with 3D capabilities. To, and that didn't really last, right? 3D television didn't really last, and uh, but so now we're going 4K, which is pretty amazing. Uh, curved screens, you know, d different technology in the screen technology, and that gets better and more impressive. But how much more gorgeous is the sunset ever going to look? You know how, how might like it might be higher resolution, it might be this, and I'm and, I, and I'm sure that. Uh, I've heard that Dolby's got some technology that they're showing where the sunscreen, the sunrise or sunset on the, the new screens is something that you actually need your shades for. It is so powerful. It is so bright and so dark at the same wow. time. It's just like, holy shit, that is not an image of a, that is not footage of a sunset. That's a sunset. You know, mm -hmm. they're like, wow, like they're going to get a tan from it, you know. But essentially the, the nature of that engagement behind a 2D screen and a 3D interactive, a truly 3D immersive world, it's, it's, it's a gigantic leap evolutionarily in terms of media and the way to experience media. And that's where there's no doubt it's here to stay. There's no doubt when people put it on. And I was skeptical in the beginning because I was like, yeah, people don't want to, it's very antisocial to, it's antisocial enough to pull out your cell phone, right? Mm -hmm. When you're at, you know, hanging out with people, it's worse to put on a headset and you're not even there. So mm -hmm. how far is that going to go? And this was some of my thinking. And I'd seen the trends in the 1980s and all, but uh, as we look at where it's going today, and you get in and you test these latest things, it's like, wow. I don't know exactly where people are going to be doing, what time of day, what the pattern is, but I can tell you this, it's, it's not going away because when you experience the good stuff, you know, it's like, don't ever try crack or heroin, right? Because one dose might do it for you. And that's really what the next generation VR is like. It's, uh, and it's just the beginning. So we're, we're in that space of time industry and commerce, you know, and medium for, for uh, interactive where it's, it's about to really radically change. I don't know who the winners and losers are going to be, but what's exciting as a designer is that we can finally 
uh, I was always trying to create immersive worlds, right? And so with Oddworld, it's still behind the screen, so you know, if it's Abe's Odyssey, it's got limited camera views, but we want to make you feel like there's so much more that you're not seeing. We want you to feel like that we've thought about all these little knickknacks that are laying around the world. Who built that? Who built this? That, that we've actually spent some time there developing it so that it really has the rich fabric of, of a believable world, even if it's done in a, in a humorous way. And, uh, and I think we succeeded at that you know, to some various degrees. People really, uh, a lot of what they love about our games is the art. Mm -hmm. and, but at that next level, it's like, how convincing can we make it to where you, know, you, you don't want to step off that space, where something that simple becomes a major obstacle in, in your experience? You know? Like, if, I, if, I'm in a 2D, if I'm in a 3D game just looking through a screen, I'm like, oh, you know, i got to cross this chasm, right? But if I'm in a 3D space, that chasm's a whole different, a whole different mm -hmm. a whole impact different on my psychology. Experience. Yes. Yeah. yes. And the the reoccurring theme of what you're saying, one of them anyway, is this love you have, and it, it's it's kind of infectious. Uh, I tend to go more towards iconic, simple graphics that aren't a lot of work to look at, but aren't necessarily um, capturing your suspension of disbelief so much. It's like, oh, you know, car cartoonish stuff. Um, y your passion for both beauty that is striking and expressive and causes people to have a transportive emotional experience while also suspending their disbelief that they truly believe they're there. Jeez, I'm totally sold. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully you, know, you know, okay, so that's one down, you know, now we only need like two million more to go. <laughs> but but uh, to, to you know, take thanks. that approach with game development uh, and, and to fit that with VR, I just can't help but be incredibly excited. Like I'm picturing, you remind me a lot of Flynn from Tron, and I mean that in the best way. <laughs> yeah. He looks at the, 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 the possibilities and, and is so overtaken with the excitement of what could happen. He doesn't notice, like, well, I guess I could die. Like, you, yeah. you haven't, uh, yeah. there's been very little in this discussion of, like, and then we made this decision based on fear because maybe we wouldn't make enough money. It's just like, we could do this. Yeah, so like, we'll see at the end of the day if, if that, how smart I am, right? <laughs> because, uh, you know, I, I'm not the best business story in this industry, right? You know, there's a lot of guys that have done the business a lot smarter. I mean, there's, there's what is it today, $12, $14 billion industry. You know, <laughs> most of that's not coming my way. But uh, there's a certain faith, you know, um, when you look at the history of, uh, like, I... I, I have a hard time separating it from a large historical context and then I have a certain face in that context and so I, I believe it, it's kind of like I have faith in the audience you know that if you if you give them something that, that very much respects uh, their appetite for for I, I don't want to say perfection I, I don't want to say excellence but but let's mm -hmm. say well-crafted beauty, you know, well-crafted immersion, well-crafted narrative. Uh, if you respect that uh, and treat that with uh, uh, grace, you know, where, where you, you're really, you might have something that you want to say, but you're really studying how to say it best because you want the audience to appreciate it, you know. Um, there's a faith that it will eventually come through with you. And, but, but I'm not foolish enough to not think that there's not a whole series of graveyard stones, mm -hmm. gravestones along the side of the gaming highway of people who thought that way and failed mm -hmm. because they didn't apply enough sort of business sense to it. And so it's, uh, it's really, uh, there's, a, there's a talk that I can see coming in the next year or two from myself, which is really sort of how to figure out how to desi design a really big property that starts really small and what kind of design problem that creates where you're putting out you know it's more like episodic television you know the way I'm trying to think of some things now and what I mean by that is let's take Lost as the example uh, or X-Files as the example let's, st let's stick with Lost it's easier we know that we crash landed on an island but we have no idea that this island is really sort of the remnant of Atlantis right that that it's a a lost space between life and death we, we we don't know if it was really a purgatory or not. We're on that island year after year after year after year, and what the creators hope is that it goes on like MASH, you know, for 20 years. I think MASH lasted 20 years. Uh, the longest running, uh, uh, what was the episode? Not episode. Uh, name, yeah, name, uh, the procedure comedy, something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Simpsons is the longest running of all time. But. Right. 
but that idea that you're planting a stake so far out that, that you know you can fill a year's worth of material and not get there yet, and, a year, and another year of 13 episodes, and another year of 13 episodes. And it was funny, I was talking once to uh, Brian Burke, who's the J.J. Uh, Abrams producer, and a guy I just have a ton of respect for. Um, and we were talking once, and, and I was talking to him about creating a television series. And he liked the idea. He said, you know, if, if, if we're pitching it, he was giving me a little guidance, you know. But one of the things he said was, he goes, you know where this is going, right, in the long term? I said, yeah. I think. He goes, no, you know where this is going. Because if you don't, right, even if you don't know, you know, okay, because you're not going to, you're going to tell the guys in the studio, you know. And that way, every time it comes where they're giving you ideas that you don't want to do, you go, oh, that's just going to conflict with the big ending that I can't tell you about. <laughs> you know? So it was, it was really interesting to see that these, these guys that are really the geniuses of, of television series, you know, bad robot, right? And other guys of that nature uh, that they understand very well that they're trying to plant that flag so far out that if they can keep getting greenlit every year, that the narrative will continue and it doesn't run out. You know, like 24 just ran out mm. after a couple. You know, how many times can they do that shtick? But if it was X Files, you know, or Mission Impossible, hell, man, we could have. You know, X Files we could have watched for another decade. I could have easily, you know, they just really started scratching the surface. Um, and so thinking about things where you go, how do we plant a seed, an exquisite seed, cheaper, faster, with higher iterations coming back to the audience, you know, episodically, uh, but we're not doing it so dumbly that, that if we don't have massive success in the beginning that we have to close the doors. Mm -hmm. And so then the the art of figuring out the design where, you know, if if we were saying, well, we we got to keep the budget really low in the beginning, but eventually, you know, after a couple of years of episodics, if we go, there, there's tens of millions of dollars in there, but we have to gauge it in a more intelligent way so that it's growing with the audience, you know, which is really kind of uh, a, a bit of a learning science that one can inherit from the free-to-play space, mm. and meaning that they, if you talk to the the Koreans and the the Asian, the Chinese that build uh, the the real free to play uh, not not just the social you know sure what I mean the the sort of originators of, of deep free to play they they would launch you know three hundred five hundred thousand dollars and if it sticks then they'll they're just fueling it right and if it doesn't boom you know basically fail faster and cheaper and and then move on uh, but if it sticks then they really start funding it and this is a different thinking than building a big triple-a title and then trying to release it for sixty dollars on the shelf mm -hmm. And, uh, and the future is more about figuring out how to deliver smaller and, and yet still try and think long term. Have faith in yourself and the audience. And part of that means that you're going to be in, in faith learning from the audience uh, in a, a intelligent, non-resistant way, mm -hmm. but still doesn't make the audience become the director, right? Because no one wants to see a film directed by five guys. No one on planet Earth, I guarantee you, that film sucks. That's uh -huh. a shit film, man, right? <laughs> and there's plenty of them in Hollywood that they've tried to release because they fired five directors, you know? <laughs> but uh, it is, it is uh, from a narrative perspective, there has to be vision, and it can be flexible. It's got to be flexible, but it has to be ahead of, ahead of a curve. It has to be taking those crazy kind of chances that puts that ball a little further out and a little further out that makes the audience want to come get it, that mm -hmm. makes the audience say, I know these guys are taking me on a ride, and I don't know where it's going, mm -hmm. but you know, they treat it with such care and such craft, and, and, and I feel so appreciated as a player, the way they've treated my controls, the way they treat the interface, the way it, the game communicates me, the way it lets me know what I'm supposed to do. You know, I get really frustrated when I get into a game, and I remember there was a game, it was an RTS game, I don't need to mention which one it was, it never became very popular, but I was really looking forward to it to coming out, and, I, and it comes out, and I'm trying to get through the demo, the tutorial, and the game keeps going, you're either incompetent or you're, uh, 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 you know, uh, whatever word, you know, and either way, you're out, you know, and so it kept on failing me, and I'm like, you morons, like, you idiot designers, you're penalizing the game player for not understanding your crappy decisions, mm. right, and then nothing is more infuriating to me, so I'm, like, really a hostile gamer, I'm like, Bah! you know, I want to kill the designer, right, and so I try to remember that in designing games, I'm sure, you know, people have wanted to kill me, too, <laughs> for the same reasons, but, you know, we mess up, but it, 
you feel so disrespected. That's how I feel. That's how I feel engaging uh, Microsoft Office products, you know, like so disrespected. It's like, Jesus Christ, I don't need your 90 freaking features and I don't need your freaking 50 pop-ups trying to get your damn browser installed. No, 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 no. And then you're like, son of a bitch, you knew I was going to click that next no button, so you switched it in a yes in that next prompt. And then you're trying to install some shit off your hardware, and now they've got one more statistic of people who've installed. You know, it's all bullshit. And you feel completely disrespected as a customer. You feel completely just part of a herd being being electro-zapped, you know, stun-gunned into the, and prodded into the range of the corral where they want your statistical data, whatever it is. But the point is, feeling respected or not, and and most, uh, I don't I don't hear most reviewers sum up game experiences that way. But I think that's really a big part of it is how whether or not as a player you're thinking I was respected as a player. Uh, I tr I try my best to do that because I get so hostile myself as a player when I feel like I've really been cheated of enough information to know what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, so this is where a certain faith of mine is if you respect the player that way. And uh, and that means you, you can't buy enough of your own bullshit. You really got to listen. You really got to be testing. You really have to have an open mind of something you thought might have been a great idea that ultimately, you know, isn't working or 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 might work but no one else gives a shit, you know. It's just not it's like you really have to be uh, paying attention. And I think if people do feel that wow, the exquisiteness of craft is there in an experience that's engaging enough that they want to keep on going with that I have a certain faith that they don't just want the price at Walmart. You know, they don't just want the cheapest game on the shelf, or they just don't need the biggest marketing campaign. Um, and that's a big part of the world we're living in today, right? We 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 have higher Metacritic games than have advertising budgets, but we're going to hear about the game that was a shitty Metacritic that had a huge advertising budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so there's a certain faith there, and we'll find out if I'm right or wrong. You know, uh, that. The audience does respect that. They are looking for quality craft. They will pay premium prices for premium content. That addresses them respectfully mm -hmm. and hopefully in an exciting way. Um, I've got you know, so much. And I try. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, before I forget this point, yeah. I don't know if you've considered doing Let's Plays because I think you could find a huge new audience uh, just playing a video game and swearing at it, I think you would have a. I think they would crucify me. You know, I mean, I, I'd like I'd be playing, and uh, you know, <laughs> the designers are going to kill me, you know, because I get so. I upset. know where to find you. Oh, yeah, man. yeah, it'd have to be rated X. You know, I'd just be like, oh, fuck it. <laughs> I was yeah, I was just irate, you know. I blew out. I blew out. Uh, I had two bouts of Bell's palsy recently after E3. One. Sorry, uh, you know, one paralyzed, the first time paralyzed the right side of my face, and the second time was the left side. Oof. The second one I blame on Outlook. <laughs> I blame on Outlook Exchange because I was sitting here with a tech uh, sysadmin, and we were both complaining because all of a sudden, you know, my calendars weren't syncing on my iOS devices, blah, 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 blah. And it all comes down to some bug that's been in Outlook for a long time, and they just don't fix. And uh, I was like, rah, rah, I was, and as I was like really getting enraged, you know, we were just having a, a, a mutual rant fest, you know, but it was like, how could they do that? Why? I hate that like, mediocre product, these shitty designers, you know, and all of a sudden, like, boom, it was like my face just went. And it was funny because uh, I, I was like, wow, I hear myself starting to slower. And I go and I look in the mirror, and all of a sudden, about 60% of any control of this side of my face just was gone. And by morning, it was all gone. And so the relationship between stress <laughs> and health, you know, is becoming ever more obvious to me. So I think if I did what you're saying, I'd probably have a heart attack on the air because I just, I get so, you know, I get so pissed about it, you know. I'm not the guy on Xbox Live who's telling you, you know, I'm going to rape your mom or something. <laughs> no, but uh, it's a uh, gamergate, guys. But, <laughs> but you but have really this genuine really passion. And geez, <laughs> it, it, it brings me to the, another point. Uh, first of all, I, before I forget, at some point, hopefully, we can get to kind of the arc of the Odd World uh, development. How there, if four or five, New and Tasty makes New and five. Tasty is number five, right? Yeah. And and I'm it, not it, including it, a couple of uh, uh, you know DS. Uh, oh, that's right. I forgot. Right, since that took place there, I think we're you know, man, eh, not not so not so great, sure. but, not quite uh, canon, but but yeah, there's, there's myself the in the trench, five games. Right. All, all you, you, you've stuck with this series, and it's your only series, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, that's right. uh, 
I want to hear about that, and I wonder also if it'll relate with this idea I have, which is why haven't the big companies come like headhunted you and thrown a bunch of money at you? Because you were talking before about how uh, people are willing to pay for a premium experience. My, what I've observed as someone who's worked in the industry on the sidelines writing about it for a while, we've seen uh, budgets inflate, 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 and you can tell that the companies who have money want to make it so only games that are made with a lot of money are seen as valuable. So that keeps them in a position of power. Uh, but that started to back, uh, backfire on them. They've seen auteurs, and you being one of the, the first in the industry, in my opinion, uh, and have influenced so many other people in the industry who are now saying, yeah, I want to make a game that made me feel the way Abe's Odyssey made me feel. I want to throw something at people that they never expected about vulnerability and about you know, consumerism and anti, uh, you know, uh, anti-establishment uh, punk rock uh, Muppets is what they want to make, and they're making it. And Thanks the to black them. metal guys, too, you know? <laughs> like, death metal guys, they're like, they're fans. They're like, I love Abe! I'm like, really? Sure. Tons yeah. of people do. Yeah, and, and like, and as you've seen, uh, the character still resonates. When you see Abe's face, you're like, I know what that character means, and that's a part of me. I relate with how he feels, because I've, I've felt that way along with him in this game, and you don't forget that. It's a relationship. Uh, so auteurs are starting to become something that big money publishers, particularly Sony, they're all about it. They're they're throwing a, an event in Vegas just for, like, video game auteurs in December, which is pretty exciting. Uh, I didn't get invited. <laughs> so there you go. I don't know. I just didn't get invited. But, you know, Sony's invited me to a lot of things. They've been, sure. Sony's been great. That's but, yeah, I, I've been asked about that. I think because we don't have a new game coming out. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's I, I suspect that's the reason they're they're largely showcasing new games. Yeah, right? true. So, so guys I know that released around our window, uh, they weren't being invited either, yeah. which is. Uh, but I was invited the year before, so right. uh, you know, all all in well and well and good. Sure. Uh, but to your point, I think here's the here's the larger thing at work. Mm. I I have not had the opportunity to just direct a game. <laughs> I've had to. Uh, raise the money, uh, you know, co-run the company, uh, sell it to the media, uh, d work with every aspect of production. And this, like, I'm not, I'm a deeply engaged director. I, I really, uh, you know, I, I've been hands-on most of the tools myself. I've been a technical director. I've been a, an animator. I've been a painter. I've uh, designed uh, high-resolution paint systems for film back in the late 80s. And... These are the, all these things uh, really go to the craft. So as a craftsman in virtual worlds, I've, I've played a lot of roles. So I'm able to help people in the trench sort of stay on target with a goal. And and I'm help. This, if if I think I, I get the most credit for for doing something, I think it's that uh, I have a pretty good ability to bring out the best in people. And that's what I think my job is as a director. I mean, I got to keep on track with a vision, but at the same time, I got to deal with uh, very different psychologies. You know, there's, there's different mindsets to programmers than there are for artists. Uh, you know, some are very analytical. The others tend to be more woo-wooey and uh, intuitive. And yet, you know, they're all valid, right? So, and then, so you're going between talking to programmers, engineers, designers, artists, financiers, distributors, salespeople, press, and, uh, you know, but in film, the, the director is usually just directing the film. Occasionally, the director might be producing the film, which I think would be pretty overwhelming, mm. personally. You know, it takes a severe type of personality to be able to handle that. But uh, the game industry has been a lot of, the reason I say I've never been able to do this thing is because the game industry has been a lot of you either have the company to do the work or you don't. And if you don't, then you have to have a job. Mm. And that's different from film, right? In film, you can become a director and you're basically a director for hire. Mm. And the game industry doesn't really do that because they're looking for teams of people they're going to carry over. You know, even Pixar wasn't doing that in the beginning. And then eventually they decided, well, let's let's reach out, let's let Brad Bird direct a picture. And so he'd come on for the duration of a picture. You know, uh, but that was a big step because that was a computer graphics production, which was very different than a film production or even an animation production in previous uh, incarnations of a studio. And um, the reason I'm saying that is then we get into bigger and bigger budgets because games got more and more expensive. But what that really meant was the when I got into games, people did not understand the value of brand. 
if you mm. can believe that. The game industry did not understand the value of IP because it did not see business in sequels, if mm. you can believe that, right? So, so in the early 90s, if you talk to publishers and you said, I'm going to create a franchise, they say, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's Mario, there's a couple other things, they're lucky. Um, uh, you know, and that's first part of Nintendo, they'll keep doing it. But, you know, sequels only make half as much as the original. Mm. So we don't really see a business in sequels. So they were looking at it, what I saw is they were looking at it like the toy industry. It was like, hey, we'll come up with a ba Cabbage Patch Kid, but if it doesn't work, we've got to move on to something else. And then when it's a hit, we're, we're only going to be a hit for so long, and then we're going to have to come up with something else. And Hollywood doesn't think that way, right? Hollywood really learned, as TV did, it's all about the brand. Mm. So they learned it's all about owning the rights to the brand. It's all about exploiting the sequels. It's all about brand visibility. So even though they're going to come out with a Star Wars movie, a new Star Wars movie, it will have the biggest marketing budget of all time. Even though it's the most popular brand that everyone knows about, it will still have all that money to make sure it makes it all back. Mm -hmm. And what that did was that it, the game industry was very much company-driven, not not project driven so the people were building organizations that were capable of building games and in every company had different software every different skill sets so the, the film industry for CG was the same way. There wasn't a common software that everyone's buying off the shelf. They were baking their own. Pixar was baking their own. Rhythm and Hughes was baking their own. Uh, ILM was baking mostly their own tools off of an alias base. Uh, Render Man. So all these things were like, if you went to, if you changed companies, you you had like a three to six month learning curve on their tool set because it would mm -hmm. be unique. That was not the case in film, right? And if you were shooting live action, you belong to a union. You're a teamster or you're a lighting grip or you're a director of photography. Someone calls you, you accept the job, you show up on a set, same camera, you know everything that's going on, same language. Games was not that way. Mm -hmm. Games was more software development. And in that exchange, it never, it wasn't evolving in that model where people would be seeking a, a really great director to help direct their next game. So. Mm -hmm. You thought of games as a team sport, then uh, you don't hear about that many well-known designers that leave. Uh, well-known designers either found their own companies, they might have gotten well-known within a company. Let's take you know David Jaffe, right? Mm -hmm. Got very well-known from working at Sony, uh, but we haven't heard a lot lately, mm -hmm. right? And uh, part of that reason is the 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 visibility spectrum is tough to break through right it's tough to get eyeballs on whatever you're doing no matter who you are and so if you're a really well known designer um uh, you might not be that desirable to bring into a culture of people that have 20 people in a row wanting to direct that next title and have been waiting there for 10 years to do it mm. and i don't know you know uh i think that as the budgets get higher and you're looking at more you know 100 million dollar titles being done or higher and higher, as we've seen in the last couple of years, there will become more of a, it's got to be directed really well, and they'll bring in more directors for those projects. Uh, but it's not really a landscape that's nurtured that so far, the way film nurtured that for decades. Mm -hmm. But I myself would be like, wow, I, I feel like I'm in a couple of positions. I, can, I could go take a job somewhere, but that means you're totally in the trench. That means you're not... That means you're answering to a whole different hierarchy that could be, the marketing department could be changing what you think is necessary to make a great game, and you're going to have to go along with that. Mm -hmm. you know? And I don't know how great I'd be at that process. <laughs> you know, right. like what if I go, look, man. Well, yeah. what I want, selfishly, is for them to just give you tons of money and just let you do things because... <laughs> because you, you think <laughs> you're, no, I don't. you describe an industry that was product based you know like you make a, a toy and it is a product that isn't necessarily supposed to express any specific idea so it's not necessarily designed to be art it can be art to somebody but it's like this is a thing for people to occupy their time with but not necessarily express something and we're slowly right. I hope getting to this point where I mean, it, it, from my end, following the industry as I, as I do working for the website, we're hearing more and more about uh, games being uh, marketable based on just who's directing it. Like, it's all new IP, it's uh, who knows who, who the team is, but it's directed by blank, and therefore people... I think we're hopefully finally getting there as games are getting mainstream. And people I hope so, aren't, too. I hope so. I hope that, you know... <laughs> A couple of things to understand, right? One, if they're going to pay 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 million, they're going to own that IP. Mm. 
they're going to. Yeah. And uh, if you talk to most, because the, you know, no one's in the donation business, right? Uh -huh. I mean, there's not, I can't, we can't go to the United States and get funding for a game. We could if we were in Canada. I could definitely yeah. do it if I was in Singapore. You know, uh -huh. I could go to Colombia and get government financing, but I can't have it happen in America. Mm -hmm. right? Which is pretty, it reflects a pretty sad state of, our, uh, of this uh, wonderful nation we live in. But, uh, where, you know, it basically will not foster the craftsmen that, uh -huh. that, that live here and have built industries here. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the government doesn't really support it. Um, but that's just a different axe to grind. But uh, uh, come back to what you're saying, I mean, we have to understand, right? Tens of millions of dollars involved, they're gonna own the IP. And I think for us, one of the things about Oddworld was that uh, we were the antithesis of that. We, we were able to sort of leverage our skill set resumes in the beginning that we started a company with a majority ownership. Mm. And that, you know, and, if, and that was on millions of dollars of financing, so that day is gone. That's, that's not really happening for anyone. Um, I mean, I could be wrong, you know, maybe someone's still willing to give Will Wright, and they're certainly going to be willing to give uh, uh, certain people that have had these knockout hits. You know, Notch could go get financed by anybody for any idea he has, I'm sure. But I haven't had that kind of a success. Mm -hmm. and people are just like, man, this guy, whatever this guy touches is just going to be platinum. Um, whatever I touch might be very crafted very well, stuff like that, but it's, but it's not, you're not thinking of it as Grand Theft Auto stuff. And... Uh, uh, but the point being is, that if they're going to invest that money, they're going to own the IP. And the fact is, for me, I've 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 come to understand that, okay, you're basically either financing your own company to, to do it, or uh, you might be able to take a project somewhere. But the game doesn't really operate that way. The game industry tends to nurture products within house, you know, mm. nurture nurture content up, and if if an entity, you know, whether it's uh, Electronic Arts or or uh, uh, Ubisoft or you know any of the big boys there's a lot of people there with a lot of ideas you know mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of them and a lot of them have a lot of a track record and they've never had the opportunity so it's like going to Pixar and, and being wanting to be a director you know there's a long line in front of you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and so that you know you can understand now I think on the if you're someone who's been deeply involved, like the Japanese, you tend to have des designers stay with Japanese companies longer. You know, Miyamoto's been there from the beginning. Now he's like running the place. But you, you also have very, you know, economy. You have designers that have been there for a long time. Uh, Namco, designers that have been there for a long time. And uh, Sega, Sega and Nintendo are the same way, right? You have these people that are very much entrenched to a science, but at the same time very loyal to a big publisher. And we have a different pattern of layoffs. We have different patterns of loyalty between the East and the West. Um, in the United States, there's almost no loyalty. You know, if they, if uh, someone sque feels squeezed by the financial pressures of their public company, they're going to be having some massive layoffs. Mm. And you don't see that in the same way with the Japanese. They look at it, uh, they look at corporations as families in a different way. And I think that will be changing more and more over time, sadly. But mm. uh, because, you know, the more it's a global economy, the more everyone's competing in the same space. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I could see doing is, uh, <clears throat> it's interesting because, A, let me just say, we're looking at a crowdfunding coming up on a new thing. Oh, cool. And, and uh, you know, and that'll be in 2015. And we'll really find out, you know, how right you are <laughs> or not, you know. And quite frankly, I'm kind of terrified yeah. because I've never asked the public to really uh, fund something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a lot of... Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of learning lessons there, but at the same time, you know, you feel like vulnerable, like we're going to give it our best shot. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's not going to be enough to really do what we want to do. So it's figuring that out, like how much can we put in, how much can we get. I'm, I'm looking at the future of games with a different hope. Sorry to bounce around on you. But no, no, not at all. The different hope is that game designers can become more like NASCARs. You know, they become more like a sports team. And if you can figure out a way to sort of keep your costs low, you know, keep your team small, uh, have more contracting outsourcing models, like different ways to keep those costs down, which is really the key. If you want creative control in any way, shape, or flavor, you got to keep costs down. And so if I go in there with a brilliant idea, I go, this is my idea. I want to own the IP, and it's only going to cost you $30 million to make. They don't care what my name is, man. It's, you know, I don't, <laughs> you know it's not going to happen. Sure. Uh, if you go in there and you say, look, here's, here's an IP. Uh, or, th this is something I'd be willing to do. Like, let's say Half-Life, right? Half-Life, we're not seeing the sequels in too long. Mm. Maybe it's too long until we see the sequels. I look at Half-Life and I go, I would direct the Half-Life. I would direct it at any studio. I could see that going to be, I could see taking that property, you know, and just escalating it up, 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 and doing an incredible job if someone was made back in it. And I wouldn't be arguing that I need to own anything or stuff like that. Like, I would love the opportunity to just direct a great IP. You know, aliens, right? 
alien, someone's like, hey, we got the aliens up here. Let me in, let me in, please, man, I'll do the best job. You know, I'll sweep floors to direct this project. Uh, there's certain IPs that I love and I think would make awesome games. Mm. And I think maybe in the future, um, maybe my availability would be there to actually offer some stuff like that. Uh, there's been a couple times where I've said to uh, two studios, if that if that property comes up and you guys want to do it in a big way, please mm -hmm. consider me to direct it. Mm -hmm. right? But that would be more of a Hollywood model. You pay me a fee, I go in, I, I try not to disrupt the studio, we try to get the great job, try to put out something stellar, and you know, I just get paid for the work. I'd love to see you make a Labyrinth movie. Uh, <laughs> Labyrinth. Even though we fully rendered Labyrinth 2. Yeah, what did they have? They had the mechanical, Was it? what was it in Labyrinth? It was an owl? Was it the uh, yeah, there was a mechanical owl. There's yeah. a, a bomb Jerry did that too. Sherry, Sherry McKinnon, they did the owl too back in that day. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sherry was all over that early. Stage. Anytime they were doing CG, you know, working with Henson and, that, and those people. That is so funny, you, funny you mentioned that. Yeah, that is wow. Yeah, I could see Labyrinth, but you know, I, what would I do? Well, you know, uh, what was her name? Uh, Jennifer Connelly. You'd have to yeah, get yeah, you know, anything starring Jennifer Connelly, man. I'll, I'll direct. <laughs> 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 so the, the the arc of the Odd World series, we're almost oh we're supposed to be out of time. We'll go a little long. Oh, it, 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 that's okay. I, I love it. So right. what what was the impetus to to bring it back? Because it it kind of had an arc, and to to reasons I think not necessarily in your control. The series didn't uh, continue to keep growing in terms of sales. Yeah. Then suddenly it's back. What inspired that to happen? Well, uh, we got into a relationship with the developer Jaw, and uh, they wanted to help us build some business around the existing library. They were like, hey, man, you know, why isn't Stranger on these other platforms? Why won't we make an HD version of this? Why don't we? And we started doing a, a few of those things, really starting around 2010. And they had success. And uh, there was a lot of care on the controls. There was a lot of things that we cared about. And we saw a relationship where uh, their artists were really, you know, putting in a lot of the care and love that the original team at Oddworld was putting in. And and then those products, you know, now is the digital distributed landscape, Steam, PSN, uh, they actually started generating the money. Mm -hmm. And really, had they not generated the money, we would not have been able to fund it. Sure. And so what happened was, was that we got to the point where, uh, you know, we were getting some money in the bank, and then... Uh, Jaw suggested, look, we would love to redo Abe. Why don't we redo him in real 3D uh, and but keep the same game? Mm -hmm. And but we redo it from the ground up. And I think they got a bit, you know, a bit in, over their head in that it, it, initially, you know, thinking of it just kind of as a as a uh, as a conversion. And mm -hmm. you really couldn't, you know, you you had to even though it might have the same puzzles, et cetera, it was, there was much, many more design challenges that would have to happen there. So I wound up getting deeply involved, spending a lot of time in the UK uh, working with the team. And that's what really led to, well, Abe, because, because look at these things, like, A, number one, what can we afford? Not a lot, you know, not a lot. And you'd say, well, we're, we're going to try and deliver. I remember having an argument with the producer. He'd say, but it, he'd say something, and I'd say, but, it's, but of course we're aiming for AAA. And he'd go, but it's not AAA. And I'd say, well, it says you, you know, but I, I'm saying it is. So if the first one was AAA and we're making it look better, how come we can't make this AAA? Huh. And, and, uh, uh, and, I, and, and this is in a playful way, you know, not a real confrontational way. But uh, the point was, was that, you know, what, what constitutes AAA? So we started targeting. We said, look, we, we, we're not going to share the spotlight with Grand Theft Auto or any of these big IPs that are coming out, but we can make something really beautiful and we can make it play really well. And instead of investing all the time in R&D in the classic sense, why don't we use that template and see if we can just bring it to life in a 21st century way, but stay true to the nostalgia, but then adapt and not think we're, we're getting an easy, easy run here. We have to, we have to bring in the design, the design decisions to actually make this thing work well, mm -hmm. work well with all the new... Uh, 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 sort of open-ended constraints that we're dealing with before we have flip screen, now we're continuous. That led to a lot of design problems that needed to be readdressed. And because we could do it, at the time we thought, oh, you know, uh, we were still targeting a pretty pretty small budget. At the end of the day, we went about three times over that. Wow. And so that, you know, that does not come without, a, without its amount of pain. But... Sure. We were very fortunate enough that we did not have to go out and get financial assistance to bring that home. I mean, I would have liked it, you know, mm. 
<laughs> it would have made it easier. But we didn't want one of those crappy old publishing deals. And mm. what I mean by that is there's a great documentary. It's called Artifact. And it's Jared Leto's uh, story of his band. Uh, was it 30 Seconds to Mars? I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the lawsuit they had with uh, EMI. And it's fascinating because it's just like the game business minus the, the $30 million lawsuit. It's, it's sure. the same basic story. Oh. And, and so, you know, those triple A's versus, you know, triple A 50 to 100, $150 million versus ours, you know, basically like $2.5 million budget by the time we got it out the door. But somehow we were able to get, you know, by, by staying true to the things that I think were very important to us, which is the integrity of the brand, the quality of the character, the, the nature of the experience, the tonal, emotional nature of the experience, and trying to just, you know, crank it up and just do it better. Uh, trying to do that for just a few million dollars was still really hard. But at the end of the day, if you go and look at Metacritic on PS4 user ratings, I think we're still number two. Wow. Behind Last of Us, you know, uh -huh. and and so I feel really good about that because uh, it kind of it kind of shows that you can, for less money, have something that stacks up there that still people are saying is more beautiful than something that costs fifty million dollars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And a lot of that really comes down to craftsmanship and direction, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, respect. The amount of again, you mentioned it before, but I want to reiterate it: the amount of respect you feel that you are being granted by the developer, you in this case, who I'm actually talking to, which is still kind of weird. But uh, <laughs> that's the games for, you know, my adult life. Uh, yeah, you feel it in these games, and you don't always feel it. You feel like you're being given a product and not a piece of art in a lot of games, but games that are devised to be genuine pieces of expression, thank God they're, they're finally making millions of dollars. We're, we're seeing that. And here you are, ready to jump on. Oh, <laughs> that's the beautiful possibility, you know. Yeah. Is that uh, I mean, we came out for uh, just to to address that real quick. Mm. We're we're like we had great success in terms of the Metacritic, the reviewers, the ratings, and and then on uh, PS4, uh, we cannot complain about this success. Uh, mm. But which basically got us into the black, mm. you know. So it's like right into the black, but it's not a cash cow. Sure. Uh, however, we still have all those other SKUs I was talking about. And that's yeah. where we think we'll make our money. The reason we turn to Xbox One, is that right? Uh, uh, yeah, so PC, uh, PC, Mac, Linux, uh, Xbox One, PS3, PS Vita, Wii U, those are the targets. Wow. And uh, so it's a, it's a lot of work, you know, and people, people are upset with us that it's taken a while to get it out, you know, and we're like... <laughs> We're just little guys, you know. We're doing our best, and we're just little guys. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's honest. Wait to play your thing. That's uh, that's kind of upset you want, I suppose. And they'll still be there when it finally gets done. I'm sure. Well, that's just tough, you know. Sometimes they're like, "Where the fuck is it, you assholes?" And you're like, "Ah, oh, man, that's kind of obnoxious." But at the same time, uh, I think if you can just step back, you go, "Wow, they f they feel that passionately about it. This is yeah. great." But at the same time, if that's how they feel because they don't have it, imagine how they're gonna feel if it plays crappy. Mm. So, so it's got to be good, you yeah. know. And and the model of the industry is release everything simultaneously, and a few of those SKUs are just going to be crap. I mean, that's pretty standard, right? Mm -hmm. People go, oh, don't play that version. It's just garbage. We, we've tried to avoid that, mm -hmm. and we were never the best at getting multi-SKU. I mean, clearly, we used, through the Xbox era, we, we had first publishing Xbox deals, so we weren't going to any of the SKUs. But... Uh, the, for the first time in the last few years, Steam really opened it up. Digital distribution possibility is beautiful. You can sell at lower prices. You can sell directly to your audience. You can you can take 70% of the return. The networks take 30%. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people sold a lot of millions of games. They never saw a royalty check in this business, not even to the developer company. But that model is changing because of digital distribution. And this is something I, I don't understand with the audience. Um, the, a lot of the audience is still like, I, I, I want the CD, the DVD, you know, at $30 it's not worth it. So I'll pay another $30 for a piece of plastic that really? is going back zero to the development community. None of that money is going back to make a better game. It's going yeah. to the retailers, it's going to the packaging, it's going to the licensing fees, all that stuff. Whereas digital distribution, I mean, it's just, it's just that much simpler and cleaner, but it's really great for the business. On the downside, what's happening is very quickly the digital distribution networks, I think led by Steam, whom I adore, but uh, led by them in a way that they become sales networks. 
And mm -hmm. we see that happening on other networks as well, where the buying patterns are changing and people are just waiting for the sales. And that's bad for the development community. Mm -hmm. Like, people were complaining. I mean, we were kind of an experiment for PS4. Uh, for an indie game releasing at $29.99 US uh, in July. And it's something that a lot of people wanted in the industry. A lot of people wanted to see indie price points rising. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, there's anxieties around it. There's, you know, there's a lot of concerns, different risks. So we went for it because we said, you know, we got a few million dollars into this title. We have to make it back. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we're sorry, <laughs> you know, that's what, but we think it's worth it. You know, this is not ripping you off. And uh, eventually the price will go down. But uh, that, was, that was sort of a temperament to see, you know, not so much can we get away with this, but is the w audience willing to pay for it and feel good about it? And that's what I think. That's what I think. One of the huge things about that Metacritic review is, particularly on the user rated, uh, is that they felt like they got good value. Mm -hmm. you know, and and uh, someone getting the game next year is going to get it for less money, but it's a year later. Mm -hmm. And when we get on the other SKUs, it'll probably be you know. Uh, uh, slight reductions in cost because it's been out there long as this and this. But the idea is, do people think they're really getting good value for what they're buying, and do they feel like you, you, you know, you were respectful for their money? Mm -hmm. And we're still fighting a lot of that in the industry because people feel like if it's an indie game, it's just ridiculous. It's not 9.99. It's like mm -hmm. fuck you. You know, you know what I mean? It's like bullshit, man. Bullshit. You don't well, understand the economics. Saying, we don't yeah. value you your thing, so give yeah. it to me, uh, even though I don't really want it that much. It's you know, for one way. I mean, I said that kind of crudely, but the truth is, it's like mm -hmm. look at the economics, right? Yeah. You guys are buying a lot of bullshit at high mm -hmm. prices, and you're not even absorb. You're not even realizing it. You're not realizing, you know, what went into it. You're not realizing what it takes. You're not realizing the differentiator between what it really takes to produce games that are okay and games that really good and it's a big differentiator right and there's a lot of the previous there's a lot of games that are okay there's even more that are crappy mm -hmm. but to have something really good it's going to take some money and you got to earn, earn that money back or you're not going to be making games anymore and so mm -hmm. that's a big science of the industry is trying to figure out where the right price points are and it's taken advantage of a lot it's taken advantage of people who are doing and it's usually publishers you know doing hd remakes that they they're not, they're not putting integrity into. I used to see Platinum Editions where they say, hey, rebuy the game you already have for now $79.99, and it has one level. Uh -huh. Or it's, it's now got this secret in there. And you're like, are people actually buying that? that mm. that's, that's called Barnum and Bailey. You know, that's, uh -huh. like, that's like carnival tricks. <laughs> you know? really but people are sucking it up, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they, they've been, uh, ingrained a collector's mentality, and it's not... If you have one really good game, it's do you have ten games for cheap that you can sit back and think, oh, well, I'm uh, I'm a collector of games. I've got all these games. I'm never gonna play these games. Like, right? It, it didn't exist for me growing up. The the concept right. of like I've got too many games to play. The backlog concept. But I'm suffering from it now. I've got like nine games I've got to get through. Uh, almost everyone I know that's passionate about this industry has gotten slowly wheeled into this way of thinking of like just get all the games and get them for cheap. But then you yeah, what do you actually ever do with them? From a consumer's point of view, you can totally understand. Uh, you know, and then, you, like what I just said a, a few minutes ago, that's more of the hostile reaction from my hostile ac accusations, right? So these people go, ah, oh, it's greedy, you're doing this and that. It's like, look at the economics, dude. We're trying to deliver AAA quality mm -hmm. on our own. Mm -hmm. And we don't have marketing budgets. We don't have this. We don't have that. We're not. You're, you're not paying for plastic. You're not paying for trucks and shipping. You're not getting any of those costs. It's just going straight back to the developer. And there's no guarantee we're going to make a profit. And mm -hmm. we need to make a profit if we're going to keep making games. Sure. And uh, so there, there, there is a fair amount of mindset that's out there. Like indie means low cost, mm -hmm. low quality. Mm -hmm. And that is just not true. If we look at the film industry and we go, who's indie, right? Every major studio opens up an indie distribution division because that's where your Academy Award games are going to be coming from. I mean, uh, movies are going to be coming from. They're, they're not the summer blockbuster. Mm -hmm. It's a film that was much more about character. You know, it's, it, movie of the year is never going to go to Transformers. Uh, uh, yeah. And Michael Bay is never going to get the award, right? <laughs> but he's going to have... <laughs> Yeah, but he's, he's going to have the biggest too. box office success, you know. Sure, he's got the money. He's got yeah. the mind share. And, and so the idea is, and this is what I think is great happening too, um, the indie community has always been something that should be looked at. I mean, I just remember the years through GDC, uh, our best people always wanted to go to the indie game jam, uh, mm -hmm. both the retreat before and then the game jam at GDC, which was always a full house. It was always one of the most packed uh, uh, talks, you know, sessions at, at GDC in San Francisco. 
And out of that community, you really saw people struggling for a long time, really brilliant people, a lot of them, that were just trying to find something. You know, they were, they were more passionate about game, making games than they were about selling games. Mm-hmm. And, and finally, through the digital distribution, through uh, Kickstarter, through a, a number of different changes in the landscape, allowed people to have smaller games, smaller teams, and start building more interesting games again. And uh, and that is a wonderful thing. But it doesn't mean they're all going to be building cheap games. Mm-hmm. You know, like like more and more people are going to be going for it. You know, look at Double Fine. Right now, they're self self financing, self-publishing, uh, and they're trying to make really quality experiences. I mean, they do them in a very a very uh, uh, stylistic way that you may not think is co- costs as much as a 3D, you know, mm. real 3D uh, mesmerizing stuff. And in some respect, it doesn't, but the quality is there. It's paid attention mm. to. And we have to, if we want to see more, uh, more great games, from the indie community, which means fewer marketing divisions making the choices, right? Mm-hmm. Which means less pressure to sell a billion dollars in week one. Right? Those are the things that kill creativity. And it's pretty obvious, right? Just look at the franchises that are doing it. I applaud them. Congratulations for all your success. I applaud the designers that are on there that figure out how to, how to continue to make uh, fans of the brand happier and happier with new iterations. Congratulations. That's all great. But if you want new ideas, if you want to get into new play patterns that don't have uh, uh, analytics that say this much of that genre sells next year, we know that for a fact, even though next year hasn't happened yet. We know Call of Duty is going to do X. We know, uh, we know that, uh, you know... Uh, Assassin's Creed, maybe. Uh, that's Creed of them is already. I can't yeah, believe it. Yeah, we know, we know that these are going to continue to sell, and hopefully uh, what's good is is that the publishers have had a, a very sobering realization that they can't just release crap. Mm, mm-hmm. So they are in, inflating those budgets. They are banking on them to bigger and bigger degrees, but pricing in the industry is continuing to hurt everybody, right? Mm. Just like piracy did. And so if we want to see more creative games being built, then A, creative people need to find cheaper ways to do them. Because I, I talked to a number of guys, and some of them are experienced, and they, and they come and they have a game idea that's $50 million. And I'm like, it's not going to happen. Just because you have a famous director, just because you have a famous property, no one's going to fund you $50 million, and you guys are going to own the IP. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know? And by the way, it, the gameplay is too inventive. No one's going to fund it for $50 million. Figure out how to f- do it for one. Mm. figure out how to do an aspect of it for one prove that there's an audience that wants this kind of play pattern because it doesn't exist so there's all these things like this is one of my biggest lessons is if you want to be more creative you have to do it cheaper Mm. and it's and and I don't want to hear that lesson you know I want to resist it every step of the way but I have to be reasonable and I have to understand if someone else is really paying for the money um, then we have to be looking out for their concerns equally as much as ours Mm. and that's a very difficult dance you know as a creator versus a funder and so, as we look forward, uh, I think one of the biggest obstacles, and I talked to a number of, of uh, basically CEO uh, indie uh, developer types that uh, really have high ambition for high quality, and they've already proven it in the tri- AAA space, right? Mm-hmm. They've already uh, very much proven themselves. They've got lots of games out there that are high Metacritic, have high sales, but they're still trying to find their independence, and they're still trying to find their, their creative uh, independence, their their their, their creative possibility to do what they really want to do and not just the finance, not just the franchise that they get funded well for and have lots of sales on but they're not really doing their dream yet and uh, we keep coming back to a common theme we call triple A indie and triple A indie basically to us means that you're striving for the same standards that you were striving for in triple A space but you just had to figure out how to do it clever a mm. lot more clever and uh, you know and still bring the same fidelity that you were shipping before on a $60 product where now you're going to be somewhere between 9 and 30 you know how do you do that and and that's a challenge so and then we have to condition the audience to want to support it. And right now, some of the audience just doesn't want to support it. They see an indie product at $20 and they just say, this is a ripoff. Mm. Well, it's not, you know, mm. but it depends. So if you have a product that's not worth $20, then it's a ripoff. But if you have one that is, just because it's not released by a major publisher does not mean it's not quality. And the real uh, proof of that is in the film industry, right? So, so far, the idea of India has been, you know, one to five guys building something that goes out very small 
uh, finds a common thread of resonance in the marketplace and uh, has some success. You know, Goat Simulator, right? Mm. Has some success and takes off and people love it, you know, and more power to them. But there's going to be more and more larger, increasing teams of more independent developers that are having success in the indie space and uh, bringing that, f that money back in and investing more into their products. And I think it gets very difficult because none of these guys really have advertising budgets just like we don't. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, no one, it's in no one else's interest to sell our game well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you really have that sober, sobering realization, and this is where it's different. When, when I, as Oddworld, when I had financial partners that owned, you know, almost half the company, it was in their interest to see us do well. Mm -hmm. Well, now that we own it all, it's it's really not. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's in the interest of a network like uh, Steam or PSN or GOG or you know, we could go across the board across the world, in the different territories and the different divisions. It's in. Uh, their interest because on anyone's digitally distributed product they're making 30 percent so they want to see more sales on products that they're not financing uh, what they're financing is the digital distribution system but it's in their interest to see us all sort of flourish more and, and to get more of a mid-tier of understanding that the public finds acceptable of you know what if this is really good quality product uh, it's worth more than just 9.99 and it might be worth more than 14.99 but a big trend that's happening is the sale trend and what we see even today and almost all networks would tell you is that almost no one's we, we see greatly reduced premium pricing because everyone's waiting for sales mm -hmm. sales are stimulated from a variety of reasons in the industry um, and a lot of times the developers is particularly the independent developers that are self-published they have to ride sales to get some exposure. So mm -hmm. they get no exposure unless they'll have a 40% off sale. And that's not a great spot to be in. You know, we, we should find better and better and better and better ways to help expose good product. I mean, um, I mentioned to people on various networks all the time, I said, look, if this was Apple, we could see what the top sellers are right away. And that's one thing, that's top sellers, but we'd also be able to see what the highest rated is right away. And that's more important because if we have small developers that are doing really high rated, highly rated work, we can count that A, uh, you know, the print magazines probably never touch the thing because mm -hmm. you're not buying their advertising, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, why? Are, uh, how much coverage are they giving to the guys that are not buying their advertising space? That's just economics in the marketing land, right? That's just Walt, I mean, uh, Madison Avenue <laughs> economics. And... So you're going to give your coverage to the people who are going to buy your ad space. That's, that's really, I'm not saying it's a fixed game. It's just the, the, the ecosystem of it, right? So they're not covering all these indie games. They might give a little space to the back. Um, so you don't have the uh, uh, ability to really market and, and uh, advertise yourself. Uh, at best, you're trying to nurture your social community, you know, your, your community of fans. You're, tr you're trying your best to, to keep that alive, to keep them stimulated, to keep the conversation going. Um, but... You don't you don't have a uh, you don't have that reach for visibility. Mm -hmm. So we need like what are the top rated games on this network for mm -hmm. this platform? We need that on everyone. We need that on everywhere. We need it on every. You know we have it in SCEE in Europe for PSN. We don't have it in the US. Mm -hmm. Do we see a difference in sales there? Of course we do. Mm -hmm. Because as someone who has no advertising budgets, uh, how are you going to remind people every day? Well, the press has already talked about your game, so they don't have anything more to talk about. Mm -hmm. The advertisers don't have any reason to push you whatsoever. Um, and so how are you going to get exposed? Why should you shoot for really great quality if you're just going to get lost in the bin after you're initially released? And I think that's something that uh, the networks are gradually realizing, you know, big organizations are hard to shift, right? They're big boats that are hard to move and change the direction. But they're gradually realizing, hey, wait a minute, you know, um, duh, you know, I like Netflix recommendations. I like Amazon recommendations. Uh, why aren't we recommending? Mm -hmm. Now think about that. How many games do you go buy and it's like an Amazon where it goes, other gamers who like this game all like these games. Mm -hmm. So that as soon as you purchase, you, you see seven other games in that genre that are, that are well aligned, right? Amazon, Jeff Bezos understands very well the attached buying pattern to that. To that. Netflix understands very well the attached uh, rate of consumption that goes with that, right? But the game industry is very slow to adapt to it at a digital shelf. I think the infrastructure of just getting a digital shelf going uh, is, is kind of overwhelming for old 
organizations that are entrenched in old business models, retail, for example, and now, you know, these are new ones emerging. In my opinion, you know, Steam's always been ahead of the crowd just because it's so transparent. At any minute of the day, I can go and see how things are behaving, keep on hitting return, and we watch numbers change. Whereas other people were still relying on quarterly results, even though it's a digital distributed business. I mean, it's yeah. antiquated, right? So um, just saying that old, older institutions that have more legacy uh, make the transition slower. But that's a huge hope is that people, you know, the, the indie community needs to be motivated to know that if it can swing hard and not get a home run in terms of user likability, you know, user Metacritic, even press Metacritic, but I think user Metacritic, the most highly rated from the users, is more valuable. And it's funny how you see that change. You know, if I look at Metacritic, I'll see they loved certain games. But the users didn't, uh -huh. right? And then, we'll, and then we'll see some flips where they're like, they'd be okay on certain games, and the users loved them. Mm -hmm. And if the more that that's visible on the homepage for every network, you know, and you, and you see it right now if you go to the Play Store, uh, you know, iTunes has it. These, these guys have them in different ways. Uh, and like I said, you know, Sony Europe has it, uh, that – the more that we see that, then the more the little guys are encouraged to just hit that quality bar higher and higher and higher because the more that will become their saving grace when it comes to sale time because if they can do that and if the networks are supporting that, we're basically most liked, highest rated, not just for Metacritic, but users. If that's visible, that always draws me. I'm always more interested in what's the highest rated, not just what's the new one, not just what has the biggest um, advertising budget, not just what has the most sales, because that's usually directly connected to the biggest advertising budget, but what was the most liked? What was the most high, highest rated? And I think that's a critical element to helping the development community be more and more successful because they can't pay for the visibility themselves. Sure, and that's kind of how Minecraft got to where it was. It was through word of mouth and YouTube videos and yeah. people, other people saying this game is amazing, and it took a long time, but now it's you know, one of the biggest games ever. Ron, yeah. I'm playing I can't help but, but – oh, I'm getting echo. Are you getting echo or am I okay? I'm, I'm good. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. I can't help but love the idea I just had <laughs> for you, <laughs> uh, someone I've just met whose games I've played again in my adult life. You would be the one to create the Oscars of video games. That isn't <laughs> just – like the, the what we have now, the uh, video game awards very much feels concocted by an advertising company. It's just a big marketing thing. No offense, Jeff Kiley, you seem like a great guy, but that's the the image of those shows. It's just like how are they going to sell us video games? It's the uh, same games. You can't tell when the commercials start and the the awards uh, end. It's the well, this is this is uh, if you have a minute, I, yeah, I sure. give you perspective. I I joined the AIS a long time ago as a member of the board. Uh, which holds the uh, uh, the craft awards, right? The the AIS awards uh, every year uh, that they announce now at Dice, uh -huh. and and uh, and I can say with honesty that I can honestly say that the we we used and and the integrity of it still carries. It was it was created for the idea that eventually it should be aired, right? Really? Uh, it, yeah, because it was about exposing craft to yeah. the wider audience. And there's statistical data that shows if you're nominated for Academy Award, you sell more movies, you sure. get more video rentals. That's you know, gravity so, you need like 200 million only after. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. So you see this, you know, people want to know what the quality is because they're careful. They're more and more careful with their expendable time as they're living in a world where they have to work more and more. Mm. Like that's one ratio of it, right? They just don't have as much free time, so they'd rather know is this good. And when they find out, the the Academy Awards, the Oscars said it's good, then then boom, the rentals just fly off and the sales fly off. So you see this big spike just from being recognized for quality by the award standards. The AIS was created. Uh, and it uses the same uh, legal entity in terms of reviewing that it was not fixed, that mm. the judging was not fixed, that the, ra the rating, the votes were counted correctly. It uses the same one the Oscars use. I forget the name of the organization. Uh, and then we also spent a lot of time, uh, and they still do, uh, wrangling 
real pros, real game makers to become review committees, review groups to actually go and give each game the time of day and actually sit there and analyze it from an industry perspective, not just from a fanboy perspective. Mm. And so these awards that just go, you know, the audience voted and it's this, you can pretty much predict this is going to be the biggest seller that year. So the biggest right. sellers are going to get the, because they're really popularity awards, they're not true craft awards. That's right. like saying, as an Academy member, right, as if you're a member of the Motion Picture Academy, the MPAA, you have to have been in the industry. Mm -hmm. You have to have your name and next number of credits. It's not like you're just the, the average guy sitting home on your on your uh, you know lawn boy and I mean your uh, <laughs> your lazy boy lawn boy mowing the lawn watching movies. <laughs> but but you know you're not just sitting there watching movies and and thinking your opinion actually matters because mm -hmm. you might be the best movie watcher in the world, but your opinion doesn't really matter when it comes to a craft award what, who had the best cinematography, sure. right? Like we're more interested in an objective group of cinematographers that are actually have displayed excellence in the craft and they may notice things that are not popular but are really great. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so the craft review groups for each of the categories that at least the AIS was doing that I was deeply involved with really were integrity. They really tried their best. They made sure that get, getting uh, buying all the games, like these are things that the budget goes to. So you have action racing, right? Well, now there's ten guys uh, voting on racing that all have to go play the game. We need to supply each of those ten guys with one of those games, right? So we need to get those from the publisher. To, like all these things are just logistics that no one really pays attention to that happen behind the scenes and they're difficult. There, yeah. There's a lot of coordinating. But here's the problem we had. So uh, I was tasked uh, with, with other people at different times to, to go down to Hollywood and, and try and get that show on the air. Mm. And in the beginning, Spike was willing to show it, but Spike didn't have the ratings. So we were looking for a major network, and a major network meant prime time. You know, yeah. meant you were on CBS, NBC, or, or ABC, someone of that caliber with that viewership and uh, the way the Academy Awards are. Mm. The problem is, is that... Uh, you know, game designers, and myself included, we're kind of boring people in the scheme of things. You know, you're not reading about us uh, having drunken, coked out orgies with hookers in hotel rooms <laughs> and leaving them trashed and then trashing Porsches on the road. You know, we're not that exciting, right? Like, uh -huh. we actually work too hard, you know? And, and, but when you think about, you know, what's the Academy Awards? What's People Magazine? It's drama. It's all yeah, drama. It's about all celebrity. Celebrities, yeah. it's fashion, it's beauty, mm -hmm. you know, people look good. Well, you know, the game community is not necessarily the best commu dress community in the world, you know, it doesn't show up in a white tie all the time even when it's asked to. Uh -huh. And and this becomes a major obstacle when you're trying to get a show aired. So the shows that are airing, uh, and I haven't paid, paid attention in a while to sort of what the logistics of the show is, how they're constructed, how they view, how they vote, but if you're just doing audience votes, then you're basically doing game popularity, not, not craft, not true sure. craftsmanship recognition. Yeah. And the AIS, I, I can attest to, legitimately really has tried to have the integrity of that award uh, really represent that your peers uh -huh. voted it this way and then the public kind of approved it, you know. Sure as opposed to just being a popularity contest. But getting on the air on a major distribution network uh, in, in terms of air eyeballs, uh, which re really means one of the main networks, you know, we just uh, we don't have the beautiful girls. Uh, I, wonder, <coughs> I wonder about YouTube now. I wonder as things have changed and, you know, <coughs> a television show gets 2 million views, a YouTube video gets, you know, 20 million. Uh, I wonder. I wonder how that would work. Yeah, I, I think... You know, I think, you know, when you look at Twitch and all the possibilities there, uh, but then you have, you know, asynchronous viewing, mm -hmm. right? So this is a big thing about primetime, a big thing about television is it's synchronous viewing. And what that means is it airs at 8 and, and they want the numbers to show up at 8 because that's what validates their income which is basically the advertisers. Mm -hmm. So the, advertising, the advertisers pay for you to watch television. I mean, that's, that's the simplest way to think about it. Mm -hmm. And so the advertisers need to cough up and believe this is a show that a lot of people are going to be watching. That's how you sell the airtime. Sure. Now, uh, different people at different times at the AIS uh, tried different experiments with different ones where sometimes, uh, you know, what if we bought the airtime and then resold it? And that may have been happening in, at, at different years, you know, because I haven't been on the board in a long time, but uh, at least five, five or so years. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
but the effort was there authentically to do both things, recognize the craft in a way that really had credibility, uh, have a voting process that could not be corrupted, have it be an equal blend between sort of developers and publishers not voting on their own games, not voting in their own categories, uh, really being checked and balanced by one another, and trying to be authentic about it. And, uh, and I, th I still think those awards carry. Um, yeah. Well, they, uh, like like a lot of integrity, they're they're very cherished for the people who get them. But it's complicated to get on the air. So when we do see shows going on the air, uh, they're coming out of networks that don't have the same visibility. Mm -hmm. And and so you know, Spike could be one. Sure. Uh, then there's, there's the IGF, there. which is mm -hmm. to me, as much as I love the IGF and a lot of the people involved with it, it's a a niche. You know, these are people who make niche games, judging other niche games. It doesn't necessarily speak for millions of people. It speaks for thousands and then such. It's it's seen as that. Whereas uh, the other extreme we have, the Spike, the VGAs, which is, like I said, just advertising. There's nothing in the middle except this show that you're telling me about now, which nobody is talking about or seeing, at least right now. So, so it's it's tough, you know, because yeah. we're we're... To really have a show of integrity, uh, we need wide distribution, you know, mm -hmm. wide network support, which means high advertising dollars, which means high visibility, mm -hmm. high viewing audience, and the gaming audience is not on TV. I yeah. mean, this is this is a big problem for television. You know, they uh, uh, and it's at, at different times. You know, I've, I've talked to. Dick Clark and the Smith family that puts on the Emmys and, and different people, you know, that, that really do these shows and have been doing them for their lifetime uh, and understand it. And, you know, all of them really have an authentic interest in wanting to get a good game show on the air. Really? But, but what we as an industry couldn't really prove, and, uh, and I tried, you know, and I know people are still trying, but what we couldn't really prove is that we could lock in that many eyeballs during a primetime event on a major network. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the uh, the game awards that have been on TV, I don't think they're showing those kinds of numbers to still get there. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm not sure, right? I could be wrong. Um, but I think that's the case because if it was, I think I'd see a major network doing that. And mm -hmm. may, maybe it's happening and I haven't been, been no, paying attention. You're, 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 you're right on. How many views yeah. have, after this? I guess we should... No, this may be the longest episode of the show ever, which is excess for me. You didn't like run screaming after. <laughs> yeah. You stuck around, so thank you so hey, much. It's for, my pleasure. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, PewDiePie is a guy. He's not going to be able to do what he does for another 10 years. He's eventually going to run out of steam. His audience is going to get old. But he's always going to be known as that guy who, as of last year, he was making $4 million a year just off playing video games and, and, and talking That's about right. Doesn't so he's number one, right? Number one earner on YouTube. Yeah, yeah and I can't remember. 30, how many millions, 30 million. What if as he got older, when he turned 35 or whatever, he's like, I'm going to segue my audience that I've cultivated to actually hosting, uh, produced by Lauren Lanning, of course, the IAS <laughs> uh, Video Awards on YouTube. That would be uh, cool. You know, would it's, you be, it's, yeah? it's, it, it's probably... You know, I'm, I'm speaking totally on conjecture, right? Sure. I'm not representing any organizations. It's it's probably where we're going to end up because let, let's face it, TV is getting more super highly fragmented, right? Mm. So we used to say, well, what's going to happen when there's 500 channels? How will people know what to watch, uh -huh. right? And and quite frankly, this is the reason one of the reasons I don't pay for cable. Mm. I don't give a shit what's on your 500 channels anymore. I'll watch it on YouTube, right? Uh -huh. And that's it. So I mean, uh, let me put it this way: my wife still pays for cable. I won't. Right, so she cares about certain things. I'm like, I don't care. Anything I want is on the web, mm -hmm. and so we have a whole v different viewing pattern. And what I think is that uh, what we see happening is the the kids graduating out of high school today, the kids graduating out of college, they're never going to buy a cable box. Mm -hmm. They will. I don't. I don't ever see that happening. Right. So we're going to see have this. It's just like the news. Who watches the news today? They're all almost over 55, right? Because the young kids are just seeing right through all the bullshit. They sure. just look, they're just looking right through it. And the 60-year-old the is still like, you know, look what Dan Rather said. You know, he really knows his shit. And you're like, no, it's all bullshit. And the, the youth gets this clearly, right? But, uh, uh, but the over 55 executive class is still sort of paying for cable. The youth sure. is not going to. They're going to watch whatever it is on their iPad, and eventually they might have a big screen, big screen but it's probably got AirPlay on it or Apple TV, you know. 
they'll be pumping it through the devices they use. They're not going to go back into the fixed old model world of cable. Mm. That being said, so so I don't think you're ever going to migrate PewDiePie's audience into PewDiePie into because uh, I'm a subscriber of his too. You know? <laughs> so I'm one of 30 million. But uh, but more as a, a observing a phenomena, really. Uh, that's that's when I started subscribing to him. Like, what is this guy doing so well? Oh that, sure, and he's doing it. Yeah, yeah. He is doing it, and he's doing it pretty clever. Um, but my point is, is that I don't think he'll be able to migrate that audience to television, and I know that's not what you were saying, but just to, right. to clarify, he won't yeah. be able to migrate that audience to television because they don't watch television. No. <laughs> right? no, if they, they do, do then they don't see the point of them. And I'm seeing that more and more with home consoles. People are kids, mm -hmm. uh, 10, 12-year-old kids are like, you do what with a TV? Wait, why do you even have a TV? I've got a, an iPad, I've got an iPod, I've got... I've said that quite a few times on the show, so they're they're doing away with all of this stuff. So they're watching, they're, they're waiting for the shows to come up on Netflix, you know, yeah. or, or or you know, one of the other various uh, uh, Hulu's out there, you know, sure. that it's given it. But however, to your point, um, look at Twitch, right? Let's just just for a second look at what happened with Twitch. So Twitch, Twitch, of course, started as Justin TV. Right, mm -hmm. which was really started by you know I think I think it's Justin Chang who wanted to be a reality TV star. Right, he'll be the first one to tell you that it all started because he wanted to be a reality TV star, and then they stuck a camera to his head, and then they wired him so he was he was wiring out 24 hours a day of a guy's life. Right, so he's got like no matter what, he's brushing his teeth, he's waking up in the morning, he's taking a shower, he's on camera, and he was the first one to do that 24 hours a day. That's why they called it Justin TV, huh. and from there they they. He got really hip in understanding sort of the the internet 3.0 behavior of the audience and realized that they were onto something else, right? So originally they just wanted to be TV stars, you know, and then they realized, whoa, we're actually onto something totally different. And then they emerged Justin TV. But what happened with Justin TV is very quickly it was being dominated by game streaming. Mm -hmm. And so it was really the first live game streaming, and then shortly after that came uh, what's the other one? Uh, Ustream. Oh sure. Right? There's a couple others, but but those are the big contenders. And so they realize very quickly, if we don't create our own brand for gaming, Justin TV is just going to be a gaming brand because whoever comes to it, that's all they're going to see because we're so saturated with gaming. So they splinter off a brand. They call it Twitch TV, which is a good name too, right? And then that becomes strictly gaming streaming. And what did they just sell for? A billion? Mm -hmm. More? They just oh, they yeah. sold to for YouTube, right? right? Yeah, he's still a young guy. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, was it to YouTube? No, I think it was to someone else, like uh, yeah. maybe Amazon or, or something like that. I don't think it was Google. Okay. I, I, could be, I could be wrong, but I don't Me think too. so. Sure. Um, and uh, the point being is that now if you look at those live streams, you have two things that take place. And, and I, I started up a company. Uh, it didn't succeed with it you know, in around 2010 to 2012. And it was focused on synchronous viewing around the world so we could all watch events together. And it was actually a platform where you could be like in a stadium and you just log in and all of a sudden you have your avatar with your face from Facebook and then boom, you're in there and you're seeing all these other people and you can watch big screen stuff together. So kind of like home except a lot more jukebox, rapid, uh, uh, expressionable. And... Uh, uh, so I got to understand a fair amount of how video behavior is working, how YouTube and how views happen. So with Twitch, two things happen. One, you have synchronous viewing, which is people logging in as you're streaming and watching your streaming. Now, the second part of that is asynchronous viewing, which is then that stream gets stored, and now people can go back and watch it. Mm. The asynchronous viewing is always a much bigger number than the synchronous viewing. So the world's largest synchronous viewing, uh, when I was doing this just a few years ago, was the Victoria's Secrets uh, runway show. I think it was like, one, maybe it was the Valentine's Day runway show, and it got a million synchronous viewers. Now, I was at YouTube and trying to convince them that synchronous viewing had a huge possibility, and it was on Monday, and the Super Bowl was on Sunday before, right? And I had a, a programmer type tell me, by the way, I think YouTube's a great organization, but this is just common. So I had a programmer type tell me, well, we don't think the future's in synchronous viewing. You know, we don't, we don't see synchronous as being future. And I said, yeah, but someone forgot to tell that to the 100 million people yesterday <laughs> that watched the, uh, the Super Bowl. Uh -huh. so, so what are you talking about? You're, what you're talking about is your behavior on your network has not demonstrated synchronous viewing, but 100 million people did it yesterday. Uh -huh. So clearly there's an appetite when the content is right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's very easy for organizations, for people to get jaded because of their own legacy. And in, their own, in the legacy at YouTube, 
You don't see the huge numbers in Synchronous. You don't even see them at Ustream or at Twitch. What you see is you have good, okay numbers, not in the millions, for Synchronous, which means when I'm streaming, but you get much higher numbers in Replay. Sure. And so if PewDiePie were to PewDiePie were to... Uh, and God, is his girlfriend not gorgeous or what? I mean, talk about how to look at. It. It's like, I always see, and the I always, women I know have, are madly in love with him. He has a huge female audience because he's not they, doing that himself. <laughs> you know, he's not doing so bad, right? So he's making four million dollars a year. You know, has one of the most gorgeous girlfriends, and women love him. I mean, we hate that guy. So, <laughs> uh, but if he were to do that, you know, what's his synchronous play going to be, and how many people are willing to log in at that time? Versus, you know, every one of his videos probably gets at least, you know, in a week or two, it gets at least three million views. But right. it takes that week or two. How many did it get day one? How many right. would it get if it were only a certain window that you could view it? Well, I wonder about how to make it an event like the Super Bowl where everyone wants to share in the same event at the same time. It's the selling people on the idea of we are a collective. You don't have to live in your individual brain anymore. You get to share a brain with everyone else who saw the past happen at the exact same time. How to get that and video games together and VR together. While you were talking before, I couldn't help but imagine because we are so antisocial to make well, this is this is something we found. This yeah. is, I, you know, I, I should pass you a video link. Uh, you know, I'll do that. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, pa I'll pass you a video link right, right when we're done and you'll see the thing we were building. Yeah. Right? Oh, and, that was great. And, uh, and it was for purposes like this. Like we're saying, look, People spend $100 for the ticket, $50 for parking, four hours to get there, just so they can feel the energy of a live event. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we went on the premise, it was kind of a gut premise, that people want to feel the energy of other people. Mm -hmm. Now, I showed this to, uh, uh, at the time, it was Senior Vice President of Marketing at, uh, uh, not tip, Ticketmaster, but... Um, Big concert promoters, the big concert uh, bookers. Yeah. Is, uh, I like uh, you too. I know what you mean. Split my mind at the moment. Sure. But like Ticketmaster, right? Uh, and they, they said, they looked at this and they said, we've seen things like this before, and we found five reasons why we think this stuff doesn't work. Uh -huh. And in looking at what you have, we think you've solved the five reasons. So that was like a great meeting, right? <laughs> and the thing being is like what we did was we said, look, being wa a million people watching the television show together does not give you any energy of being at a place with a million people. Mm -hmm. But what if we can change that? What if we can make it feel like I can look around and I can see all these people here, right? Whether it's with a mouse or eventually with a VR headset. Uh, I can see all those people there. And believe me, VR is going to be huge this way. Uh -huh. I don't know if you saw the uh, Beck test that they did at the Beck concert where they put a surround mic and cameras where you could basically uh, log in to that camera device with your headset and then now you're on the stage with Beck. Wow. In 3D, live, audience, girls, you know, cleavage, <laughs> you're like right there, right? You're seeing what he's seeing on the stage and you go, okay, okay, let's think this through. So Facebook concerts, a concert is still the major uh, revenue generator for the music industry, right? Concerts, live performances. People will pay a lot of money. And so an act will largely stay in a city until it, until it can't sell any more tickets, right? That's, that's the windows of, they'll be appearing for all week, you know, at this, at this concert or whatever. So music industry continues to struggle on how to make money. Now you go, wait a minute, Facebook concerts. So Shakira or uh, uh, Beyonce is going to have a concert in Tokyo uh, on Saturday night that you don't stand a chance in hell going to and it won't really be televised. However, if you log in with your headset, uh, there will be four, cam four surround cameras and mics. That these things look like, like Sumerian godheads. You know? It's just weird because they got all these ears around them and then all these cameras around them. And then you can log in and you can be like this, right? And you're, you're, you're getting it. And like it's CG, except it's live action. And now, you know, Beck stands around doing it. The sweat is coming at you in 3D from the stage. Like, there he is. He's five foot ten next to you. I don't know if he's five foot ten, but you know what I mean. Scale is real. And you look out there, it's real. And now I could jack to another camera here and there. Would I pay $10 to log into that? Certainly, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not a Beyonce fan. You know, if it was Pink Floyd, I'm there. But let's say Beyonce. So now that place was ordered to sell 60,000 tickets at 100 and something dollars a piece. 
but it could now sell two million mm. one night, one concert at ten dollars a piece. Mm -hmm. So two million at ten dollars a piece is what forty million dollars an extra. Mm -hmm. uh, no, wait a minute, ten dollars. That's an extra. Yeah, that's just an extra result. So there's twenty million dollars now revenue that wasn't there before because you set up three mics in the in the amphitheater. Uh huh. Wow. Right? Think about that. Think yeah. about that. Right, Ooh. Julio Iglesias, like the biggest, one of the biggest album sellers of all time. Right, if you have VR headsets in the Spanish-speaking territories, how many people would log into Julio? It'd be huge, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea that you can add this whole other level of live performance experience and make people feel connected to that live performance in a way that they can't do through a TV set, because that's what they find out. There's a reason we don't watch concerts on TV because no one cares. Mm -hmm. There's a reason, you know, I, I talk to all these guys that, that run, the, uh, you know, whether it be Ticketmaster, whether they own sporting teams and owned arenas, you know, that, that we were trying to understand what is the pattern of the, of the mass viewing audience that comes in and wants to feel the energy. You know, if you talk to sports fans, they will all tell you, ah, oh, there's nothing like being at the Super Bowl when a touchdown happens. You, mm -hmm. you don't feel that anywhere, right? They speak to it as, as though it's a mystical thing. Mm -hmm. and, Nowhere online are you capturing that energy. We were after capturing that energy. Yeah. And, I think, and I think, you know, someone's going to crack it. And we were finding interesting metrics. We were finding that if people were in there watching events with people that were their friends and they had a meaningful, simple way to express themselves, they added the crowd dimension to the experience. And right now, crowd, you know, Twitch TV does not really do that. Uh, Ustream TV does not really do that. What I'm seeing is I'm seeing a guy talk and then I'm hearing him respond to a bunch of chats. But right. I'm not looking over at my friend Tom and I'm not looking over at Susie and I'm not looking at these two over there ha having their conversation. I'm not seeing that. But yeah. in the ability where I can, where I can feel the presence of others, and that's the aspect we focused in on, then it's a, it, it's a game changer. We found that, uh, you know, just doing that with like a... Uh, a jukebox effect on YouTube where, you know, you could post a video, but then we watch it together. If we don't like it, the rest of the audience can vote it down and mm -hmm. vote it off. You know, kind of like how Turntable FM was working, but with much better with video. If people were spending, suddenly they'd watch 10 times more YouTube videos a day. Uh -huh. They'd extend their viewing session from three to seven minutes to 60 to 90 minutes. Those were huge, you know, uh, indicators of a possibility. Now, for various reasons, you know, we didn't make it, right? It didn't, it didn't get its Series B financing. But it was, it was like we could taste it. It was that close. And when we had experiments, and it was mostly game industry guys that, that we hired to be involved with us in making it. You know, we were testing it in the evenings, and we just we were totally addicted to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and not because we built it, because it was totally addicting. Uh, but you had to get a lot of things set up to really make it work right, so we didn't ever really launch to the public. But the point being is that I know what you're saying, that solution is there. That solution is on its way. Uh, we were trying to provide it. We didn't make it. Um, I haven't seen anyone try to improve it. Let, we have, uh, since uh, we have a huge obstacle of people because of the behavior, because of the technology delivery systems that we've had with the networks that exist like YouTube, we have a, a legacy metric that says, oh, asynchronous is where, where the numbers are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then Twitch came on and said, well, sort of asynchronous, mm -hmm. you know, with a little bit of synchronous in the beginning, really, really add some energy, and then we can let them asynchronously watch later. So platforms will be coming, particularly in the VR space, where when you log in, you know, you're seeing other people, and that's a freaky thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when you turn like this, and there's someone turning and looking at you, and you lock eyes, <laughs> all of a sudden, or not necessarily eyes, but at least heads in the right direction, you know someone's looking at you. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's freaky, you know? Yeah. Uh, Aaron oh. Davies, at uh, uh, one of the uh, biz dev guys at Oculus, who's, who I think is a great guy, uh, he said he was testing early in uh, Minecraft, uh, with uh, before before they got bought by Facebook, you know, Minecraft was doing some stuff for Oculus, yeah. and he said, you know, I get in a headset in Minecraft, and it's exactly kind of what I expected it to be. And he said, but where it really messed with me is as soon as I'm looking at someone and I see them looking, and we're looking, and then we're locked, and it's like, holy shit, that person's really looking at me. This is not a game character anymore, and it's uh -huh. not, and it's not, and, and it's not just an AI character because that happens a lot in games. This is a real person. Right. And he was he was telling us just his personal experience of what how that made him feel in that moment because he had never felt that before, mm -hmm. and in a, in a gaming experience. And uh, so I think it's very interesting where it can go the sort of synchronous live platform. I think someone like PewDiePie is well is more well known in the space to draw more eyeballs than let's say. Uh, I think we hired at the AIS. I think the AIS hired a great 
uh, guy to do it, and that was uh, Jay Cohen. No, no, not Jay Cohen. Jay Cohen's on the board. Uh, Jay Moore. Jay Moore. Jay Moore. Jay Moore. Yeah. yeah. And sorry, sorry, oh, Jay. <laughs> and Jay's actually running uh, uh, down the street. He's running the uh, game war gaming. Uh, oh, okay. Here in Emeryville, California. But uh, uh, and he's on the board of the AIS. So excuse my confusion for a minute. But Jay Moore. He did the awards for several years, and he was great. And uh, because he's a hardcore gamer, and he's he he resonated with the audience a lot. You know, even with the C class, you know, he'd get up on stage and he'd make fun of the Japanese guys. You know, so like Nintendo was just appalled. You know, <laughs> but everyone thought it was hilarious. You know, everyone thought it was great. And so you had that more kind of uh, uh, the feeling that someone really understood your industry and understood the products, but at the same time they. Uh, <laughs> They were. They well, let's put it this way: He's not Pudai Pie. He doesn't uh, have thirty million followers. No, he doesn't. He's a talented guy, and yet you can't, as you've mentioned many times, talent important. Being in the right place at the right time, finding that fit, and the, the we'll have to close up. I can't help but. I just want you to live for a whole long time, Lord Lanning. Oh but man! You have, <laughs> from, your, uh, from your mouth to God's mouth. <laughs> so many ideas you have, and it's just about when the rest of the world is going to line up and 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 give them an opening so that they can work. The AIS Awards with VR, hosted by Abe from Abe's Odyssey, <laughs> that would be incredible. That, that's something that should happen. Uh, all these things need to line up, and I just hope you keep existing and keep trying as you are, so they can eventually happen, and I'm excited about what you're going to do next. Stranger's Wrath is out. Uh, well, Stranger, Stranger's Wrath releases on mobile uh, in the coming weeks ahead. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, Android, Android TV, uh, iOS, and uh, so far uh, Google and Apple, they just love it. So hopefully we'll, we'll get some good features. The guys that did this Square One Games up in uh, Vancouver, they did an awesome job. Uh -huh. Really good. The, pre the last title they did was Bard's Tale for Brian Fargo oh, cool. and, right. uh, on mobile. So their model is chasing sort of AAA console titles of unique flavors that they can get the rights to and then uh, use their platform technology to bring it over. So that's Stranger's Wrath coming out to mobile. And, I, and I've never played a game from beginning to end that I made before after I delivered it because I'm just sick of the game by the time, you know, a couple of years go by and all the headaches. But... Uh, <laughs> I played Stranger Through twice on mobile, wow. and uh, just you know helping the guys and and really kind of surprised there. And then the rest of the SKUs for New and Tasty, we're trying to get to as soon as we can, uh, but we don't have dates yet. Uh, but we're trying, you know, we're not slacking, and they've got to be good. I mean, that's they've got to be good, and so we we can't say a date when we know that they'll all be up to par. Sure, and they can follow that on Twitter. At yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, hashtag Oddworld Inhabitants and uh, the Oddworld Facebook page, Oddworld Inhabitants Facebook page, and uh, and then Oddworld.com, you know, has a regular news stream keeping keeping people up to date and posting, uh, you know, sure. relevant stories of where where we hope to be, you know. And I would but, hate for you to get Bell's palsy, but it, you would get so many views. <laughs> if I did that? Live on YouTube. Yeah, you know, so, it, it's tempting. It's tempting. Uh, but, you know, then, then the, like, the real me would get shown, and I'm not sure how, how many shots I'd take. You know? But, yeah, I really, I really, you know, I'm a really bad game player. I mean, I just get so upset. You know, I'm like, is, I watch uh, these guys raging on it. Yeah, I watch wanted, these... yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, after you. Uh, they, people, and this is one of the themes of what you've been saying, they want craftsmanship, of course. They want... Uh, uh, suspension of dis disbelief, but they want that genuine connection. Yeah. Whether you're making eye contact with a stranger on Minecraft or hearing you scream about Microsoft Office or <laughs> getting this genuine idea that you transmit through your creativity and your imagination, that's what you want and that's what you're aiming to give them. It's a wonderful thing to say. Well, we're trying, and thank yeah. you. I really, I really appreciate you saying so. It means oh, a lot. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 hopefully we kept cooking. He, hopefully yeah. we kept keep kicking. <laughs> so good. I mean, you, you, you've been through a lot and here you are, uh, still present, still working, still pulling it off. Uh, me, I'm at Trodnots on Twitter. It's an old name I came up with back in the geez, sureyoucan.com days. I'm still, wow. Yeah, it's hard to, that's a old Street Fighter <laughs> website from like 2000. They're popular again. Anyway. That was your, that was your Yahoo account. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, I am a Trodnots on Twitter. You can watch it later on YouTube. Just look up uh, Sub Home Show 
on YouTube. You can listen to it iTunes and uh, Limston. And that's it. Well, f- we did it. The so longest cool. episode ever. Lauren Lanning, you, you win that award and many Woo-hoo. other awards. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was great being here. Thank you.